hands on that chair. He does. Why? Why? Uh, yeah, I, it's been a rumor for a while. Okay. Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. Committee is meeting today to examine the most serious threats confronting our homeland. Before I recognize myself for an opening statement, I'd like to take a moment to welcome the newest member of our committee, Don Bacon. Don served nearly 30 years in the Air Force and his experience in cybersecurity and airborne reconnaissance will prove greatly beneficial to this committee. Thank you, sir, for being here. Thank you, Chairman. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. I'd like to thank each of the witnesses, Acting Secretary Elaine Duke, FBI Director Christopher Ray, and CTC Director Nick Rasmussen for joining us today. You represent thousands of patriotic men and women who go to work every day to ensure the safety of their fellow Americans. Everyone on this committee is extremely grateful for your service, and Director Rasmussen, uh, for over two decades, you have helped navigate an unprecedented landscape and combat terrorism around the globe. You've been a great partner to me and to this committee, uh, and I would I'd like to call you a friend. Um, and we all wish you uh, the best of luck in, I hate to say retirement, because that's in whatever you do after this. Uh, this past year has been a, a particularly devastating one. In just the last month, we witnessed another terror attack in downtown New York, and over the summer, parts of America, including my home state of Texas, were greatly impacted by hurricanes and other natural disasters. We also saw several heinous acts of violence that included the mass shootings in Las Vegas, Southern Springs, and the hate-fueled homicides in Portland and Charlottesville. Tens of millions of Americans also felt the effects of cyber attacks from hackers and other cyber criminals. These are just a few of the horrors that hit our homeland. On Islamist terrorism, over the Thanksgiving break, an ISIS-affiliated group attacked a mosque in northern Sinai that left 300 people, including 27 children, dead. While this attack was thousands of miles away, it was a reminder of the savage nature of an enemy that always has our homeland in its sights. In the aftermath of 9-11, the Department of Homeland Security was created to prevent further attacks, and I believe we are better prepared than we were 16 years ago. However, in that time, Al-Qaeda has expanded its global presence, and ISIS has conquered parts of countries, slaughtered innocent civilians, and inspired new followers. By using encrypted technology and by spreading in, in, incessant propaganda across the internet, jihadists are recruiting new members and planning new attacks. This has been obvious by a series of vehicle homicides across Europe. Cities known for their history and culture like Paris, Berlin, London, Nice, Barcelona, and Brussels are becoming more familiar as terror targets. The attack on Halloween in New York was proof that our homeland is also susceptible to this line of attack. Terrorists are answering Sheikh Adnani's call to kill Westerners using whatever means necessary wherever they are. And while our enemies are always adjusting their tactics, we know that our aviation sector is still their crown jewel of targets. Earlier this month, our committee was briefed about aspects of airport security. To our dismay, it was made clear that we have a long ways to go. We must do more to address a threat also posed by foreign fighters who have fled 
the battlefield and remain one flight away. Consequently, we have identified key areas that need improvements and look forward to working with the TSA to see them through. To help defeat terrorists, we must work with private tech companies to limit their communication capabilities and use all of our economic and military resources to dry up their funding and crush them on the battlefield. When it comes to border security, another ongoing challenge is keeping our borders secure. Human traffickers, gangs like MS-13, drug smugglers, and potential terrorists are continually looking for new ways to sneak into our country. We must do whatever we can to stop this illegal entry, especially those who wish to do us harm. In October, this committee took a, a big step in the right direction by passing the Border Security for America Act. This legislation, which I introduced, calls for building additional physical barriers, including a wall, fencing, new technology, and a surge in personnel. It targets drug and human traffickers at our ports of entry and will help identify visa overstays through the full deployment of a biometric entry exit system, which the 9-11 Commission recommended. Our homeland cannot be secure without strong borders, and I look forward to getting this bill to the floor. Natural disasters. This year's hurricane season devastated many cities and towns in my home state of Texas, in Louisiana, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. After Hurricane Harvey, I personally toured much of the wreckage back home. Roads were flooded, homes destroyed, and many people lost their lives. However, I was amazed by the strength demonstrated by people who braved dangerous conditions to support one another, Texans helping Texans. I was also impressed by the quick action taken by our heroic first responders and by the emergency response at the federal, state, and local levels, thanks to a coordinated effort led by FEMA. A broader recovery will take a long time, but I know that if we continue to work together, we'll be able to successfully rebuild these communities that were shattered by these powerful storms. On the issue of cybersecurity, America's cybersecurity networks are under attack. In September, we learned that Equifax has been successfully hacked and 145.5 million people may have been affected by the breach. Last week, it was also reported that 57 million people use Uber, that they may have been had their personal information stolen from a cyber attack in 2016. This cannot continue. Fortunately, our committee has made strengthening DHS cybersecurity a top priority. In 2014, bipartisan committee efforts resulted in the enactment of legislation that provided DHS expedited hiring authorities, ensured DHS is assessing its cybersecurity workforce, and clarified the department's role in cybersecurity of federal networks. In 2015, the Cybersecurity Act provided liability protections for public to private and private to private cyber threat information sharing. We've had some success, but we need to do better. And that is why this committee passed a bill to elevate in the operational capabilities of DHS's cyber office to better protect digital America. And finally, on the issue of domestic terror attacks. Domestic terror attacks and violence ignited by white supremacists, the KKK, or anyone else who preaches prejudice must not be tolerated. As I've stated before, threatening the safety of others and using intimidation tactics to advance political or religious beliefs is simply unacceptable in the United States. Too often, we are seeing that our differences lead to violence, and this must be stopped. As a nation, we should stand together and reject any type of hatred that seeks to divide our neighbors as enemies. This is an issue we will explore further 
in our second panel. In conclusion, Homeland Security must be bipartisan. <clears throat> the terrorists don't check our party affiliation. And there are certainly other threats, from ballistic missiles, weapons of mass destruction programs in North Korea and Iran, to the continued undermining of American interests by nation states, including Russia. As we face these threats, we must put our homeland security before partisanship in politics. I'm proud to say that this committee has had a long track record of doing just that. We've improved information sharing for counterterrorism efforts, increased support for first responders, and in July passed the first ever comprehensive reauthorization of DHS with an overwhelming bipartisan support. This reauthorization will allow DHS to more faithfully carry out its mission of safeguarding our homeland, our people, and our values. And I'm hopeful that the Senate will finally take up this vital bill as soon as possible. So with that, uh, I want to thank again uh, these uh, very uh, prominent and uh, important witnesses for appearing here before this committee. Um, and with that, I uh, recognize the ranking member. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing uh, on keeping America secure from terrorism. Hang on just a minute. We I'd also, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank both panels of witnesses uh, for today. In the wake of the disturbing rise of domestic terrorism in recent years, Democratic members of this committee have repeatedly asked for a hearing on this important topic. While this hearing is our annual one examining worldwide threats, a great deal of our conversation will likely be focused on the terror threat from right here at home. Incidents like the 2015 killing of nine churchgoers by a white supremacist at Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston and the hate fuel violence that left a young woman dead and 19 others injured during a white supremacist rally in Charlottesville earlier this year highlight the threat posed by domestic extremists. Domestic terrorist organizations have even adopted some of the same techniques for recruitment and radicalization as foreign terrorist organization using the internet to reach followers and coordinate their actions. For one thing, it means that we're showing to this parasitic class of anti-white vermin that this is our country. This country was built by our forefathers. It's sustained by us. It's going to remain our country. I believe, as you can see, we are stepping off the Internet in a big way. Uh, for instance, last night at the Torch Walk, there were hundreds and hundreds of us. People realize they're not atomized individuals. They're part of a larger whole because we have been spreading our memes. We have been organizing on the Internet. And so now they're coming out. And now, as you can see today, we greatly outnumbered the uh, anti-white, anti-American filth. And at some point, we will have enough power that we will clear them from the streets forever. That which is degenerate in white countries will be removed. So you're saying showing up in physical space help, lets people know that like they're more like them. We're, right? we're starting to slowly unveil a little bit of our power level. You ain't seen nothing yet. Unfortunately, President Trump insists on fueling the fire of hatred and extremism in America, calling marches in Charlottesville very fine people. And just yesterday, retweeting inflammatory anti-Muslim videos posted by a far-right British organization. James Clapper, the former director of national intelligence, called Trump's retreating of the videos bizarre and disturbing and said his action undermines our relationship with our friends and allies. Americans should be able to look to our president for a steady hand and responsible leadership in uncertain times. But unfortunately, President Trump consistently conducts himself 
in a way that jeopardizes our security and is not befitting the office he holds. Also, though they cannot say so themselves, the president's actions make the already difficult jobs of the witnesses joining us on the first panel today even harder. The Department of Homeland Security, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and National Counterterrorism Center play key roles in securing the homeland from terrorists, both foreign and domestic. I hope to hear from these witnesses today about the challenges they face, what emerging threats we should be aware of, and how Congress can support them in their mission, consistent with our American laws and values. Since much of our focus is typically on foreign terrorists, today I'm especially interested in hearing how the witnesses assess the threat from domestic extremists and terrorist groups and learning what can be done to protect us from this rising concern. I also look forward to hearing from our second panel of witnesses on this topic later this morning. They bring special expertise on domestic extremism and terrorism issues, and I hope members will hear what they have to say and engage in a thoughtful dialogue. The Southern Poverty Law Center, in particular, is dedicated to fighting hate and seeking justice and equality for all Americans. And I look forward to their recommendations for countering the ideologies that are inspiring violence in America. I had hoped to have the NAACP testify as well, but the invitation was issued less than 24 hours prior to the hearing, and the late notice prevents their participation today. I look forward to inviting them to testify at a future hearing. In closing, I want to say that we know there are those around the world who seek to come here and do Americans harm. Those charged with preventing such attacks have the unwavering support of all the members of this committee, consistent with the laws and values of our nation. I hope that some attention and resources will be dedicated to fighting domestic extremism and terrorism here at home to ensure the security of all Americans. Again, I thank the chairman for holding today's hearing and look forward to a productive discussion. I yield back. The uh, ranking member yields back. Other members are reminded opening statements may be submitted for the record. We're pleased to have uh, two distinguished panels of witnesses before us today. Our first panel includes the Honorable Elaine Duke, Acting Secretary of the United States Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Honorable Christopher Ray, Director of the FBI, and the Honorable Nicholas Rasmussen, Director of the National Counterterrorism Center. The witnesses' uh, full uh, written statements will appear in the record. Chair now recognizes Secretary Duke for an opening statement. Good morning, uh, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, and distinguished members of this committee. It's my honor to testify here before you this morning on behalf of the men and women of Department of Homeland Security who shield our nation from threats every single day, often in extremely dangerous environments. We are reminded of that this past week when we lost Border Patrol Agent Rogelio Martinez in the line of duty. I truly appreciate and know our country appreciates his service and sacrifice. While we do not know for certain the circumstances of his death, we do know that he courageously chose a dangerous job with DHS because it was so important to our nation's security. When his father was asked why his son chose the Border Patrol, his son said, I want to defend my country from terrorists. I want to prevent terrorists and drugs from coming into our country. And he loved this job. I want to begin by noting right now that the terror threat in our country equals, and in many ways exceeds, the period around 9-11. We are seeing a surge in terrorist activity because the fundamentals of terrorism have changed. Our enemies are crowdsourcing their violence online and promoting a do-it-yourself approach that involves using any weapons their followers can get their hands on. We saw this just last month here on our own so soil when a terrorist killed and wounded pedestrians in New York City using a rented vehicle. But New Yorkers rallied, and they refused to be intimidated by this heinous attack. 
I also want to make it clear that DHS is not standing on the sidelines as these threats pro proliferate, and we will not allow frequent terrorism to become the new normal. The primary international terror threat facing our country is from global jihadist groups. However, the department is also focused on the threat of domestic terrorism. Ideologically motivated violence here in the United States is a danger to our nation, our people, and our values. We are tackling the overall terror threat in the United States head on in two ways. First, we are rethinking Homeland Security for this new age. There is no longer a home game and a away game. The line is blurred and the threats are connected and across borders. That's why DHS is moving towards a more integrated approach, bringing together intelligence, operations, interagency agreement, and international action like never before. Second, we are raising the bar in our security posture across the board to keep dangerous individuals and goods from entering the United States. That includes building a wall on the southwest border and cracking down on transnational criminal organizations that bring drugs, violence, and other threats to our communities. Illegal immigration puts our communities and country at risk, which is why our border security strategy is multi-layer and includes robust interior enforcement operations to deter and prevent illegal entry. We are also strengthening everything from traveler screening to information sharing. We now require all foreign governments to share critical data with us on terrorists and criminals and to help us confidently identify their nationals. We must know who is coming into our country and make sure they do not pose a threat. That is why I recommended uh, and the President approved tough but tailored restrictions against countries that pose a risk and which are not complying with our security requirements. And we are trying to st stay a step ahead of emerging threats. We are planning next to launch a new Office of Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction next week to consolidate and elevate DHS's efforts to guard against chemical, chemi chemical biological, radiological, and nuclear th threats. Separately and additionally, our global aviation security plan is making it harder for terrorists to target U.S.-bound aircraft with concealed explosive or by using corrupted insiders. At the same time, we are rededicating ourselves to terrorism prevention to keep terrorists from radicalizing our people. And our newly reorganized Office of Terrorism Prevention Partnerships will lead this charge. Finally, we have stepped up DHS's efforts to protect soft targets, which will not only help better defend our country against terrorists, but against tragedies we have witnessed like that in Las Vegas and Texas. Americans are also alarmed by the spike in terrorist attack. DHS is engaging with Congress on legislation that would establish a new operating component dedicated to cybersecurity. On behalf of the entire department, I appreciate the critical role this committee plays. Thank you for holding this hearing, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Madam Secretary. <clears throat> the uh, Chair recognizes the FBI Director Christopher Ray. Thank you, Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Thompson, and members of the committee for the opportunity to talk to you today about the threats that we face uh, and the tremendous work that's being done by the people of the FBI. I will say that from my prior law enforcement and national security experience, I already knew how outstanding and dedicated the men and women of the FBI were, but I have to say that from the past three months here in this job, seeing it from this perch has made me feel even more humbled uh, and inspired uh, to work with them. The people that I get to work with every day around the country and around the world are mission-focused, they are passionate, uh, and they are utterly determined to be the very best that they can be to protect the American people and uphold the rule of law. In coming back to government after being gone for about 12 years, what struck me the most is some of the changes that I've seen, the evolution of the threat, the changes in technology, the capabilities that have been built. And as I've been getting briefed up on the work we're doing and encountering firsthand how we do our work in today's environment like we just had in New York, uh, what's really struck me is the magnitude of the threats we face and the diversity of the threats we face. On the terrorism front, in addition to international terrorist groups and homegrown violent extremists, 
we also have domestic terrorists intending to influence or coerce our government through violent criminal activity. In the cyber arena, we have not only nation states, but also sophisticated criminal actors. And in our counterintelligence work, we face threats from nation states targeting not just our national security secrets, but also our ideas and our innovation. And they're doing so not just through traditional intelligence operatives, but through non-traditional collectors like scientists and students and businessmen. On the terrorism issue in particular, uh, my prior experience had been very focused on large, structured organizations like Al-Qaeda. And to be clear, we still confront threats from organizations like Al-Qaeda planning large-scale attacks over long periods of time. But we also face groups like ISIS, who use social media to recruit followers remotely and to inspire people to take to the streets with crude but effective weapons like hatchets and vehicles. Smaller in scale but greater in volume, these organizations, if you can call them organizations, move from plotting to action in a very short period of time with very little planning using low-tech and widely available attack methods. On top of that, these terrorists' use of social media and encryption technology has made it harder to find their messages of hate and destruction, leaving even fewer footprints or dots for us to connect. The good news uh, is that I have also been very impressed and pleased at the progress that the FBI has made since I was last working with them, particularly in the areas of intelligence integration and partnerships. Intelligence is now heavily integrated into every program the FBI has, into our overall mission, our training, uh, and it drives really everything we do. In addition to that, the scope and strength of the partnerships that the Bureau now has with our federal partners, our state and local counterparts, the members of the intelligence community, and our international partners are at a whole new level compared to what I saw when I was in government before. So while remarkable progress has been made, we cannot become complacent, and we need to keep improving to ensure that we're up to the task and getting ahead of the threat. As one example, we are now at risk of losing one of the key tools in our toolkit that is invaluable to all of our national security programs that I just mentioned. As I mentioned at the beginning, the speed and agility of our terrorist and intelligence adversaries has increased at a tremendous pace, putting a huge premium on matching that speed and agility with our ability to connect the dots. And that's why reauthorization of FISA Section 702, which expires in just a few weeks, is so incredibly important to our work. It's one of the most powerful tools that we have to help us evaluate leads and prioritize threat information. It can tell us quickly whether a person here in the U.S. has ties to a terrorist overseas or if there's someone overseas who's planning an attack. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of this committee, I look forward to working with you on these and other significant challenges, and I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank, Thank you, you, Director. <coughs> Chair recognizes the NCTC Director, Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Ranking Member Thompson and members of the committee. As I mentioned during my testimony before the committee last year, the array of terrorist actors <coughs> around the globe is broader, wider, and deeper than it has been at any point since September 11, 2001. And as we meet here today, the, the discipline of terrorism prevention is literally changing beneath our feet every day, and it requires that we respond with extraordinary agility and flexibility. I'd like to take the opportunity today to share what I've seen in the way of changes in the terrorism landscape since I last testified before the committee. <coughs> and I'll also say a few words about areas where we can do a better job of tackling the threat of those in the homeland who are mobilized to extremist violence and to strengthen our CT capabilities. So let me begin with what's changed or what's new with the overall threat. And those developments fall into three primary areas. The first of these is the coalition's success in shrinking the territory that ISIS controls in Iraq and Syria as compared to a year ago. The second major trend is an uptick in, in attacks inspired by ISIS that we've seen against Western interests around the globe in the last year, as compared to attacks that are directed by the group from their headquarters in Iraq and Syria. And the third trend I would point to is the resurgence of aviation threats, reaching a level of concern that we in the intelligence community have not faced since AQAP's printer package plot back in 2010. 
So to start first with ISIS's losses on the battlefield. ISIS is clearly facing significant battlefield pressure from U.S. forces and the coalition, and the size of the territory the group controls is shrinking day by day. As ISIS copes with that territorial loss, though, the group will look to preserve its capabilities by operating more as a covert terrorist organization and as an insurgency from its few remaining strongholds in Iraq and Syria. Now, this is undoubtedly good news. We are winning on the battlefield. But unfortunately, territorial losses have not, have tra have not translated into a corresponding reduction in the group's ability to inspire attacks, even including here at home. And over the last year, ISIS has inspired numerous attacks, particularly in the UK and Europe, and most recently right at home, as has been discussed earlier in New York City on Halloween. The number of arrests and disruptions we've seen, disruptions we've seen around the globe, while that is a testament <clears throat> to effective law enforcement and intelligent work, it also tells us that the global reach of ISIS remains largely intact, even as the group is being decisively defeated on the battlefield. Now, that uptick in inspired attacks stands in contrast to the pattern of attacks we saw that were directed and enabled by the group in, from Syria in 2015 and 2016. So far this year, though, we have not seen the group successfully direct a large-scale sophisticated attack like the Paris and Brussels attacks in previous years. But the number of inspired attacks, as Director Ray uh, uh, mentioned, is clearly on the rise. And all of this underscores our belief that there's not a direct link between the battlefield position of ISIS in Iraq and their capacity to, to continue inspiring external attacks. And so battlefield losses are not enough, not sufficient, to mitigate alone the threat from ISIS. It's also worth me uh, saying, as, as even as we are focused on ISIS as a primary terrorism challenge, that, that al-Qaeda has never stopped being a primary counterterrorism challenge for the United States and a top-tier priority. So even as we point to ISIS, we continue to see the continued evolution of al-Qaeda as a resilient organization. And we know that al-Qaeda retains the capability and intent to carry out attacks against our allies around the world. And I'll touch quickly now on the third development that has stood out in the threat environment, the threat to civil aviation. There's a long history to terrorists seeking, see, seeing, seeking innovative means to carry out aviation attacks. And aviation has taken center stage again this year, as evidenced by Australian authorities disrupting a plot back in July uh, by terrorists to bring explosives aboard an aircraft. Terrorists have shown themselves to be persistent, out-of-the-box thinkers with respect to aviation. Aviation-related threats have long been and will remain at near or at the top of the things that demand our focused attention. This brings me to my final point. We need to do a better job of tackling the threat of those mobilized to extremist violence, particularly here in the homeland. One of the things we do in the intelligence world uh, quite well, that we do quite well, but we're always looking to improve on, is collecting intelligence and sharing it with those who need it. We share it across our various federal agencies and increasingly with partners around the country. We also do a great job of pushing uh, unclassified information to partners around the country. But beyond just sharing intelligence, there's certainly more we can do to prevent homegrown violent extremists <coughs> from becoming radicalized, and we need to improve the toolkit that we use to deal with this problem. In short, we must expand our investment in terrorist prevention, <coughs> specifically here in the homeland doing what we can to prevent the recruitment of American youth and ensure that communities are equipped to respond and prevent all forms of violence. Now, I'm proud of the good work that I do, that my folks at NCTC do in this area, along with Director Ray and Secretary Duke's teams on this, on this matter, but it's something that I'm sure we could do better at and I'm sure we should do on a greater scale. By leveraging all aspects of the fellow, uh, elements of the federal government, uh, working with state and local partners, I'm, sh I'm certain that we can create a better and more significant culture of prevention and resilience across the United States. I'll end there, Mr. Chairman, and once again thank you and the committee for your continued support of the work we're doing at NCTC. And speaking personally, thank you for your friendship, uh, the committee's friendship, and the kind words uh, that you used earlier today uh, as I move on from federal government service and step down from NCTC at the end of December. But even though I am grateful for your kind words, I'm also mindful that whenever I appear before you, I am standing on the shoulders of many hundreds of talented women and men at NCTC. Serving along, alongside those professionals has been the honor of my life. It's their amazing work that I bring before you as, a, as their representative, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director, and thank you for your service uh, to our country over the years. Um, I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, Secretary Duke, uh, we recently held a, a hearing with the TSA administrator. 9-11 uh, was an aviation attack using airplanes as guided missiles uh, into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. 
Um, this is still the crown jewel of ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, the Inspector General produced a report on the uh, findings in terms of screening at airports, and quite frankly, it, it was, in my words, uh, at the last hearing, disturbing to find uh, that the TSA still has received a failing grade, a failed report card um, when it comes to screening. Now, we heard this in 2015, and now we're in 2017. As you know, with the laptop uh, threat, the uh, ability to convert laptops into bombs and explosive devices to blow up airplanes, possibly inbound flights into the United States, um, I, can, I think I speak for almost every member of this committee, uh, that we need to take quicker action. There is technology available today. There are pilot programs today using computer tomography. It's like going from an x-ray to an MRI. Uh, we, a lot of us on the committee have seen this, and so I sent to you a letter requesting uh, that this technology uh, be deployed not in 2018 or 2019, uh, but as soon as possible, given the nature of the threat that exists. Uh, can you uh, respond to that letter? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, and, and we agree with you that computer te te topography or CT is essential. It's part of our um, plan to raise the baseline of aviation security. We are currently developing the algorithms necessary to fully deploy that and, and agree with you it is essential um, for our TSA future. And, and what the administrator said was, well, we, we can't deploy the technology today because we'd have to upgrade the software later. I think we should look at it from the other way around. We should deploy the technology today and, and stop procuring these x-ray machines, deploy that de uh, technology today, and then upgrade the software when it comes available at a later date. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I agree. We are moving, uh, we are already procuring some. Like I said, the algorithms um, are the uh, running different materials through to make sure that the machines can detect what we need them to detect. That's in process now. And um, we, we are, uh, along with our foreign partners, working on making that the new standard for, um, for passenger baggage. Well, I view that as one of the greatest threats to the homeland today, and so we'll be providing a follow-up um, to Director Ray and Rasmussen. Uh, you know, over the five years of my chairmanship on this committee, I saw the, the rise of ISIS and the rise of the caliphate and the rise of external operations and the threats coming out of that region. I think, fortunately, we are now seeing the fall of the caliphate, the defeat of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, but how do you see this threat evolving um, as we move on post-caliphate. Uh, Director Ray. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think as Director Rasmussen said at the beginning, on the one hand, the collapse or the building collapse of the caliphate is good news, but I think the way we're concerned about a number of different things that could come out of that. One is, uh, of course, what everybody in the world is concerned about is foreign fighters returning. I think in our instance, what we're primarily seeing there as a risk is that some of them would return not directly to the U.S., but perhaps to countries, say, in Europe, and then from there come into the U.S. Uh, second, we're concerned about homegrown violent extremists who continue to be inspired by ISIS, even if not directed in the sort of classic sense. Uh, and we know that ISIS is encouraging fighters who aspired to travel to stay where they are and commit attacks at home. So those are some of the issues that I think continue to exist uh, even with the caliphate collapsing. Well, and I think the power of ISIS as opposed to Al-Qaeda is the Internet. So I, 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 I know you've worked with Google, Facebook, Twitter. I have as well. I look forward to working with you and the Secretary to try to get this stuff in NCTC off of, of the Internet. Uh, Director Rasmussen. I would echo everything Director Ray said and just, just make one simple analytic point about this, a distinction that we've observed between al-Qaeda and, and ISIS over the years. Al-Qaeda operated in most ways as a clandestine covert organization um, with barriers to entry that made it difficult for individuals in many cases to become members. ISIS sought to become a mass movement. It sought to reach people regardless of their prior affiliation with extremism and to, be, and to literally recruit anyone who would come in the door 
and agree to, uh, uh, to align with the ISIS worldview. That means that the ISIS ver variant of this problem has brought us many more individuals who are radicalized around the world. And so it is a, a, a problem that extends further and wider than the Al-Qaeda problem that we faced. That's not to say it's all bad news. There's plenty we have done to, to mitigate the, the, the possibility of large-scale catastrophic attack, the kind of directed attacks that, that Director Ray spoke about earlier. So I'm not here to solely point to a bad news story. I'm just pointing, at, pointing out that it's a different kind of problem today than what we faced a few years ago. Thank you. Final question, Secretary Duke. Um, my home state was hit, uh, uh, was devastated by Hurricane Harvey. Parts of my district, uh, some members on this committee, I've been there many times to see the devastation. Uh, I understand the decision perhaps was not yours, but made out of OMB, the office of OMB. Uh, but I have to just express my disappointment on the record at the recent 44, uh, I think, billion dollar uh, disaster recovery supplemental request. It was just a fraction of what my governor, Governor Abbott, uh, determined that Texas alone needed to recover. Uh, it does not adequately take into account the devastation in the other areas uh, as well. And of course, uh, uh, places in my uh, District have, have flooded three times over the last two years. We need flood mitigation efforts. Um, this is something that Congress will be making decisions on, but we have to entertain not only the response recovery, but the flood mitigation. Um, I would like to, you to respond to that, recognizing uh, that this was not probably your decision to make, but I do want to register uh, my um, disappointment with the administration on this issue. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, and I, I recognize that the, uh, the amount in the supplemental did not totally address all the future needs of the disasters we experienced this summer. What that was intended to do is fund the Stafford Act work that needs to be done. Um, currently, um, I have looked at it, and I think it's, uh, it's appropriate and, and um, it, it, it's enough for the near term. We do have more work to do um, along with the housing and urban development and um, will be with Texas and the other areas uh, until that work is done. Um, and I think that the innovative housing program we're doing that, the, what's known as the Section 428 housing program, is going to be really helpful in restoring Texas. Well, thank you, and I look forward to working with you on that. Uh, thank you. With that, the uh, chair recognizes the ranking member. Thank you very, <coughs> very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in light of your question, one of the ongoing challenges we have is that Stafford Act jurisdiction is in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and FEMA is over here with us, and every time a problem comes up, people look to us, and it's where T&I comes. So that's an ongoing uh, battle that we have dealt with from uh, our inception as a committee, and I hope uh, some of this get resolved fa fairly soon. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Duke, uh, the Inspector General recently notified Congress that uh, a report on the travel ban was being held up in your office. Uh, can you provide us details on why it's being held up? Uh, there it was a disagreement between the Office of the Inspector General and DHS on privileges that included attorney-client privileges and executive privileges. Um, and because the Attorney General does not agree with those um, privileges, um, what had not issued the report. Um, we feel it's important to maintain some of those privileges, especially since the matter um, addressed by the report is under litigation. I feel comfortable that the privileges we had to um, assert to the report were uh, accurate. However, to be absolutely sure and make sure the public is confident too, um, we have ordered a third party review, uh, <laughs> independent review, uh, to make sure that the privileges um, that we need uh, to redact that report are um, sound. But you are aware that the Inspector General concluded that the department violated uh, certain aspects of, of the law relative to the implementation of it. 
Yeah, there, there were quite the the report itself was based on decision making that you know by practice is, is executive privilege, and so um, it was problematic from the start. Uh, but we still um, are committed to working with the attorney general and making sure that. Uh, I, I understand, but you just you're aware. Yes, of, I am. of their conclusion. Yes. All uh, right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ray. Uh, good to see you again. <laughs> since we met. Uh, in another forum yesterday. Uh, can you share with us uh, your analysis of the domestic terrorism threat here in America and what does it include? Uh, yes, uh, Ranking Member Thompson, um, as we've discussed uh, a, a few times, I think uh, the FBI assesses the domestic terrorist threat to be a significant one, a major one. Um, it presents some of the same kind of challenges that we see with homegrown violent extremists in that you're talking about loosely confederated people with less communication, less sophistication in the plotting the attacks. Sometimes you have lone offenders, so-called lone wolves. Some people like to use that expression, which makes it more challenging from a detection and prevention perspective. Uh, at, at any given time, including right as we sit here today, the FBI recently has had in the neighborhood of about a thousand pending domestic terrorism investigations. Um, those cover the waterfront from everything from white supremacists and sovereign citizens, uh, militias, all the way to anarchists, um, environmental extremists, et cetera. But the key point with all of them is that they are we are only focused on people who are engaged in violent criminal activity. Uh, and that's what we're investigating. That's what we're focused on. We're not focused on ideology or opinion or rhetoric. Thank you. Can you provide the committee with the most recent uh, reporting on, on the, the categorization of, of those different terrorists? Uh, I'd be happy to have my staff get together with yours and see if we can get you some more helpful and detailed information on that. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the things uh, for uh, our departing uh, uh, NCTC director that the uh, FBI director talked about was homegrown violent extremists. You referenced that in your testimony as part of that three-legged stool uh, that you've been concerned about. Can you share with us uh, uh, why that is um, a concern of yours? Absolutely, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, as Director Ray noted, many of the individuals who we categorize as homegrown violent extremists don't typically engage in the kind of behavior that makes detection and disruption uh, easy for the law enforcement and intelligence community. They aren't necessarily communicating. They aren't necessarily gathering in large groups. They aren't necessarily traveling to conflict zones or engaging in the kind of behavior that would be good predictors that someone might be uh, interested in carrying out a terrorist attack. And so that puts a tremendous amount of pressure on law enforcement at the local level and certainly my FBI colleagues to try to figure out who is the person who is just there dabbling and sampling and looking at material, and who is the person that is actually um, looking to maybe mobilize and actually act on their beliefs and carry out a terrorist attack. So that becomes a much different challenge, uh, a much more difficult challenge than what we face typically in trying to disrupt sleepers, so-called sleeper cells or other terrorist cells that might have infiltrated the country from abroad. Uh, it's just a harder problem. So uh, is your testimony that uh, that we need more funding to address that increasing uh, homegrown terror threat in this country uh, since you've identified it uh, as a growing uh, 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 vulnerability for us as a country? I wouldn't necessarily pose it as, as being only measured in funding. Uh, I think about the communities around the country where I've had conversations with local law enforcement, and they clearly desire greater federal help, I believe, in understanding the threat landscape, in understanding how it is that these homegrown violent extremists appear in their midst. And so if we can do that through information sharing, if we can do that through um, 
sharing of personnel and best practices, then that to me would be a, a contribution. I just don't think, I think the scale of the problem is such that we have to put more effort behind it. I wouldn't isolate funding alone as the issue. Thank you, I yield back. Chair so recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ray, uh, in October of 2015, uh, Director Comey was testifying before this committee and, and uh, I asked him if he had the resources he needed to handle the terrorism investigations uh, that were pending before them and, and this also to investigate the surge of attacks on soft targets that were occurring at the time. And his response was, um, uh, to be honest, I don't know. So um, I know the FBI has been stretched thin over the last few years and had to pull agents off criminal investigations to look into these terrorist uh, attacks. Uh, but I would pin, pose that question to you. Uh, I know you've only been there three months, but have you been able to determine whether or not you have the resources you need to uh, meet the challenges that you face? Well, at the risk of sounding like my uh, predecessor, uh, but combined with the fact that I've only been there for three months, I'm still taking stock of that. I will tell you that everywhere I turn, I find uh, people who want the FBI to do more of something. And someday I'd like to find somebody who would identify something they'd like the FBI to do less of. Um, I haven't met that person yet. Um, and so we have a lot of challenges, as you say. I think we have matured to the point where we're not having to pull people off of programs quite the same way that, that used to happen. Um, I think, as Director Rasmussen said, it's not just a question of funding. I'm not convinced we could spend our way out of the threat. Uh, some of it is getting smarter. Some of it is working better collaboratively. And I'm very pleased with how much better the FBI, which wasn't always that way in long times past, is working with its partners in the federal law enforcement intelligence community, foreign partners, state and local law enforcement in particular. Um, so we have to be smarter, we have to get better technology, and we have to make sure we have the right resources. Uh, could we do more with what we had, with, if we had more? Absolutely. Well, we, we need you to uh, let us know if you get to the point that you determine that you need uh, additional uh, resources to be able to meet your needs. We can't fix it if we don't know about it and try to get you what you need. So I would ask you to uh, not be shy. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Secretary Duke, welcome back. Uh, a lot of work has gone into um, improving our visa uh, security process, but it's clear that vulnerabilities remain, especially in identifying those who are radicalized over the internet. So can you tell us what, if anything, is being done to connect the USI, USCIS and the visa process to the latest intelligence uh, uh, to help vet applicants uh, from uh, high-risk areas? Sure. Um, we have instituted many new visa um, uh, review steps that are going to help with making sure that we have the true identity of the persons that are applying for visas and uh, also that uh, they don't have a uh, criminal purpose in coming here. One of the biggest things we're doing is uh, the 100% interviews um, and also looking at advanced information sharing. As we talk about some of the other topics, the, the, the speed we're moving at, having that information sharing with the other countries countries is absolutely critical, and, um, and doing the vetting against the databases. Also, social media checks, um, where applicable, have played a huge role in better vetting of visa applicants. Those are a few of the areas. Okay, and, and this may uh, not be dramatically different from that answer, but uh, what steps has DHS taken under the Trump administration to develop and implement what he has referred to as extreme vetting? Well, it's been a multi-level uh, step. First, we decided what sh vetting should be. What additional steps should we take in vetting people? Then we compared the country's performance. And what were those additional steps? Those additional steps were uh, making sure that uh, passports had um, biometrics, that we had copies of those passports, um, that um, countries provided us advance information, um, those, those similar types of, of steps. And, and we have a full report on that that, that we can provide. Um, and then we compared the, um, and, and the countries actually using our databases and, uh, and us using theirs. Um, then we compared the country's performance against that, and um, we, um, we have instituted uh, get well plans, if you will, for the countries that don't fully conform to the new vetting standards. So would you uh, assert then that this the new uh, status of extreme vetting is fully implemented now? 
it, it is fully implemented. Um, we always have to get better. Um, I think that every time we put a, a fix in place, um, the enemy gets uh, adapts to it, but uh, it is in place. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. So I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. It's much appreciated. Uh, Secretary Duke, you mentioned that uh, terrorists will use any weapon at, at their disposal uh, you know, on uh, different terrorist threats. And so I have a question for Director Ray in that regard that uh, now there's ten, tens of thousands of individuals and many of the attacks we're talking about, guns were clearly a part uh, of this and firearms and weapons and tens of thousands of individuals removed from the NICS background check, the National Instant Criminal Background Check for guns uh, after the FBI changed its uh, interpretation of uh, and limited who's considered a fugitive from justice. Uh, that decision was made in February, it's now December. Uh, we have no idea how many people brought firearms this year, even though there are outstanding warrants for their arrest, just because there's no evidence they crossed state lines. Now, how did this uh, decision come to be? And, and isn't this a gap in trying to secure uh, our safety and, and trying to keep these kind of weapons away from uh, terrorists and their, you know, we have websites that are telling people and directing people how to get these kind of weapons, uh, but we have a fugitives from justice now in our own country uh, that aren't being uh, picked up by the NICS system now. Uh, could you just tell us why that was done and, and if there's something to fix this gap, which I, can, I think is a very serious one. Uh, thank you, Congressman. The, the uh, change that you're referring to um, was the, uh, the product of several years-long debate, as I understand it, between the FBI and the ATF about the interpretation of that prohibitor, the fugitive prohibitor um, under the Brady Act. Um, and the FBI had interpreted it as not requiring um, crossing of state lines, and the ATF had interpreted it differently. Uh, and under the prior administration, uh, the Justice Department came down with a legal determination prompted in part by the Inspector General uh, and resolved that legal disagreement about what the statute meant in favor of the narrower interpretation uh, that is different from the FBI's interpretation at the time. And so I think it was in January that that change was, um, legal change was declared. Um, and the department, again, under the prior administration, as I understand it, sent a uh, notification to both House and Senate Judiciary Committees uh, notifying them of the change uh, and the impact of the change um, and essentially inviting uh, legislative fix. And so it may be the kind of thing that can be addressed through legislation. But once that change went in place, the FBI uh, promptly complied. Well, thank you for clarifying that. So that's on our watch now. Uh, as members of Congress to change this, and I hope we do. Uh, uh, Secretary Duke, uh, thank you too for uh, clarifying uh, and, and agreeing to move uh, forward on the CT technology and getting that in the field. That's something our last hearing uh, really had a great concern about, and thank you for doing that. Uh, but Administrator Bukowski too said that uh, the other issue is it's a budgetary issue uh, in moving these things forward. And I realize the, you know, the uh, monies that people pay uh, for a fee outside of uh, things on their own uh, as they board airplanes, uh, that that money uh, was moved, uh, again, uh, by Congress uh, away from that. Uh, but can you tell us right now, if we provided that budgetary assistance, you'd be able to move quicker for that new technology in the field. Do you agree with the administrator on that? Uh, uh, yes, we, we have the money to uh, deploy, to build out, re complete research and development, and deploy some machines. You know, uh, as uh, uh, the FBI director said, there's always more to do, but right now I feel comfortable that we're deploying that technology. We also have the commitment of some of our foreign partners. But if I could, my time's running out. If, if indeed uh, there were more money, he, he indicated if there was, it's a budgetary issue as well. Uh, is that correct? It's a prioritization issue, yes. Well, uh, all right, uh, I think it's a priority uh, if we're gonna keep uh, uh, our people safe here in this country that are traveling in the airlines uh, quickly. Uh, 
the NRC, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, in terms of cyber attacks, has tried to upgrade uh, requirements for nuclear plants. I have one in my district uh, facing, in a few years, decommission. And they've applied for a waiver away from these cyber security upgrades so that it's not uh, there for an attack. And, and I'm, it's, it's my understanding that uh, Homeland Security really doesn't have the role that it's really the NRC. Don't you think you should have a direct role in this? I think you should. Uh, I don't think the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the right uh, agency by itself to be making those kind of uh, safety concessions uh, and considerations in terms of a cyber attack. Yes, to my knowledge, you're correct that we don't have that specific role on waiving. We um, do assist the critical infrastructure sectors, but do not have that direct regulatory role. Well, thank you. And I'd like to engage the, uh, uh, your office in terms of trying to suggest ways to shore that up. It's another gaping hole. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Yeah, just a, a quick clarification, Madam Secretary. Um, are the monies available today to purchase the computer tomography technology? We have some funding for the CT technology. We, we do not have the funding to deploy it at every airport. Would nationwide. that require a reprogramming by Congress? That would require, uh, to buy for every airport would require much more than a reprogramming. Okay, and I'd like to follow up with you okay. at a later date on that. Thank you so much. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance and your service. Secretary Duke, you talked a little bit about the vetting process and uh, the extreme vetting process a little bit. I'd just like to drill down on that a little bit and ask you, is there a system to investigate or at least query in a minimal sense, at least, uh, the intending entrance, entrance for an ideological affinity to some other alien or hostile legal system opposed to the U.S. Constitution, similar to what was done by the United States during the Cold War with some of our adversaries whose ent potential entrants wanted to come into our country? Yes, um, an affiliation with an ideology or a country that is known for ideologies that are contrary to the United States um, is something we look at um, in terms of the, the extreme vetting. So, so there's literally a question and answer portion to that, or when you say you look at it, what does that mean in practical terms? One of the things we look at is where a person has traveled to, and if they show a travel pattern in countries uh, that have a, a, a high degree of terrorism, we look at that. We also look at social media, if appropriate, to see if, we're, if there's anything on it that indicates they are following terrorist websites, those type of things, for example. Well, not only just ter terrorist websites, but things that are antithetical to the West and democracy and our Constitution is what I'd be interested in as well, uh, not only just terrorism, but that. And I'm wondering, do you literally question them as opposed to just looking at their travel uh, and maybe social postings? Do you ask them, um, do you agree with the United States Constitution? Would you uphold and defend the United States Constitution? Do you believe that Sharia law should supersede, for instance, the Constitution? I, I, I do not know the specific questions um, of the interview, but I uh, can get back to you. And I do know they adapt based on the, the person's scenario. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And I will look forward to, uh, to a, a, a continuing conversation on that. Uh, Director Ray, thanks for your service. Uh, good luck to you. Uh, just curious, if you can tell me if the FBI has taken any steps to reverse the previous administration's purge of training courses and information about Islamism, Jihad, Sharia, and the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood? Uh, Congressman, I'm not aware of any ongoing efforts to, to purge uh, training material. They, they were purged in the last administration. Oh, so my question is, have you taken any steps or said the FBI as you know it, taken any steps to reverse that purge or include some of those things that allow us to see in totality the threat that faces America? Uh, I have not studied what has been done in the training, but I appreciate your bringing that issue to my attention, and I'm happy to take a hard look at it. Okay. If we could have a continuing conversation on that as well, I'd appreciate it. Director, Antifa operates across the U.S. in ways that involve at least potentially criminal interstate activities, such as inciting a riot and conspiracy to incite riotous behavior. I'm wondering if the FBI is doing anything to counter Antifa in that regard, including and in investigating uh, their, their funding sources. Uh, 
As I mentioned to Ranking Member Thompson, we do have a, a very active domestic terrorism program. Um, and while we're not investigating Antifa as Antifa, uh, that's an ideology, and we don't investigate ideologies, we are investigating a number of what we would call anarchist extremist uh, investigations where we have properly predicated subjects of people who uh, who are motivated to commit violent criminal activity on, on kind of an Antifa ideology. Uh, so we have a number of active investigations in that space um, all around the country. So that space would include individuals, but if a group itself, even though, like you said, it's an ideology, but if the group is receiving funding to promote that ideology, which is in, in, uh, not, in con not congruent with the law, is that something that you delve into, especially when it crosses state lines? Well, certainly, when we, anytime we're doing a domestic terrorism investigation, whether it's to just into an individual or to, let's say, a, a collection of individuals, we do enterprise investigations uh, when there are multiple individuals working together. And the funding that supports violent criminal activity is absolutely something we're keenly interested in. Okay, I appreciate it. Uh, finally, uh, Director Rasmussen, um, regarding Antifa and their international networks, can you describe how the NCTC acts to counter them if you do? Uh, thank you for the question, but we actually don't. With respect to domestic terrorism issues here in the United States, my agency's mandate and authorities are limited to matters of international terrorism, and that was in the, in the founding legislation that created NCTC, so we defer to FBI. Uh, in this role. So if there are international connections to, to these groups that are operating domestically, you turn that over, you don't take any... You, well, that, well certainly if, if there was intelligence that tied any individual here in the United States to a foreign terrorist organization, that changes the nature of the problem and becomes very much a collaborative effort. With but the, if it's not a foreign FBI. terrorist organization, but foreign organizations or foreign funding, does that, does that um, invoke your authority? Not to my, I, I don't believe so unless it would involve a foreign terrorist organization. But if that kind of intelligence were, emer were to emerge, we would certainly make sure our FBI colleagues were aware of it. Thank you, sir. You yield back. Chair recognizes a uh, general lady uh, from New York, Ms. Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so this question is for um, Director Ray. Um, earlier this week, uh, Kareem Baratov, a Canadian citizen, pled guilty to charges that he worked for the Russian intelligence service, FSB, as part of the 2013 Yahoo, uh, Yahoo hack that led to the theft of 500 million Yahoo accounts, one of the largest cyber breaches in history. Uh, three, other co three other conspirators, including two Russian FSB officers, have been indicted but have evaded arrest. This case is the first time the U.S. has issued criminal charges against Russian officials for a cyber attack, even though Russian aggression has continued to rise in that area. We have seen large-scale cyber attacks on U.S. companies, Equifax, Uber, Verizon. Uh, they're just some of the biggest breaches this year. What other cyber attacks do you suspect Russian involvement in? Without commenting on any specific investigation, I think you've put your finger on what we view as one of the more dangerous emerging threats, which we refer to as a blended threat, which is the, uh, and it's particularly seen in the exact example that you mentioned, the Yahoo uh, attack, where you have the blend of a nation state actor, in that case the Russian intelligence service, using the assistance of criminal hackers uh, which you think of almost like uh, mercenaries being used to commit cyber attacks. Uh, and one of the reasons we thought that bringing that particular case was important, even though, as you say, some of the defendants are Russian government officials who are safely in Russia, uh, was to try to highlight to the public the, uh, the importance of being vigilant on this threat. And so we are seeing an emergence of that kind of collaboration, which used to be two separate things, really sort of nation state actors and criminal hackers. And now there's this collusion, if you will, that's occurring on a number of instances. What do you think Russia's motivation is for these attacks? Well, I think, uh, I think Russia is attempting to assert its, its place in the world uh, and relying more creatively on asymmetric uh, 
um, a form of asymmetric warfare um, to uh, to damage and weaken this country uh, economically and otherwise. Uh, we've been focused today on terrorist threats at home and abroad. Should the American people consider Russia's repeated attempts to breach their personal data as a terrorist threat? Well, I think it's certainly a threat we should take seriously as a national security matter or a homeland security matter. I don't know that we would brand it um, a terrorist threat, but I, I think that to me is a, a labeling issue more than anything else. It certainly is a very serious threat that, that the public needs to be aware of and that we are all working collectively to try to do more to combat. Well, I guess it depends on what you feel the motivation is at the end of the day, what their motivation is and is this just a part of getting to that ultimate goal. Um, what steps uh, What steps are you taking to, in your uh, department, taking to deter these attacks? Number one, do you expect any future indictments of Russian officials without naming any? And uh, lastly, uh, or just on this part of the question, do you believe that, they're, that uh, they will ever be extradited and brought to the U.S. for trial? Well, taking you the last part of your question first, um, we don't have an extradition relationship uh, with Russia. So they, if they stay in Russia, uh, I wouldn't necessarily expect to see them coming to the United States. On the other hand, if they travel, that's going to be a challenge for them because they are now, at that point, fugitives wanted by the FBI. Would we uh, pursue them then? Absolutely. Um, as far as what we're doing, we have uh, tried to model more and more our cyber efforts al uh, along the sort of more developed front that we have in the te terrorism space. So we have, just like we have JTTFs in all 56 offices, we have cyber task forces in all 56 field offices that are multi-agency, that have 184 different agencies participating. We have um, uh, something called CyWatch, which is a lot like our national terrorism watch, where we coordinate closely with DHS and others. We're trying to do more private sector outreach because one of the things that's different in the cyberspace than the terrorism is the need to kind of work with the private sector. Well, I'm so. glad to hear you say that because I think that's a great idea. And, and finally, uh, Russia's interference in the 2016 election was an unprecedented attack on our democracy. Uh, what are uh, what are you specific or your agency doing to protect our election systems in 2018? You know, the, the chairman has been really, I think, bravely outspoken on this issue and talking about how this is not a political issue. It is an American issue. It's a democratic issue. Um, are you working with social media companies to prevent the dissemination of Russian fake news and limit the effects of Russian trolls? So first, uh, needless to say, I take any effort to interfere with our election system by Russia or any other nation state or any non-nation state extremely seriously because it strikes right at the heart of who we are as a country. We have at the FBI, we're focused very much forward-looking on the next you know, couple of election cycles. So we're doing a couple of things. We have a foreign influence task force that I've stood up inside the FBI that brings together different divisions of the FBI because it's a multidisciplinary kind of problem. Um, so you've got counterintelligence dimension, a cyber dimension, a criminal investigation dimension. Uh, we coordinate closely with DHS, which has responsibility for the critical infrastructure dimension of our election system. We're coordinating with our foreign partners because, uh, happily for me, we don't have elections every year in this country, but other countries do, and we can learn from what Russians and other countries are trying to do with other elections in terms of the trade craft, et cetera. So we're trying to kind of get in front of it and figure out and be on the lookout for efforts to interfere going forward. So that's a, a, at a high level a summary of what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Donovan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank all of you for what you do to protect our nation and the sacrifices you and your families make for our families. Uh, Secretary Duke, uh, you noted in your testimony that you're rethinking Homeland Security for a new age. Um, in many cases, however, DHS is still operating on the same authority that it was issued since 15 years ago. Uh, we, our role, we have to ensure that you have the tools and the resources you need to address the ever-changing threat, threatened landscape of, in our nation. As you know, earlier this year, this committee, under the leadership of Chairman McCall, crafted and the House of Representatives approved the first ever comprehensive DHS reauthorization bill. The bill authorizes vital grant programs for first responders, 
It enhances intelligence and information sharing, and it provides authorities for a number of DHS components like ICE, CIS, and the Coast Guard. What effect will this reauthorization, this reauthorization bill have on the Department's ability to meet its mission, and how important is it that the Senate expeditiously acts on this piece of legislation for you and your efforts of the brave women and men who work for you? Thank you. Uh, we think the author authorization bill is, is very important to DHS. And what it will do is it will help us partner uh, with Congress in terms of prioritizing and making sure that we're um, focused with laser vision on the homeland security issues that faced our country. So I think um, it, it, it is very important because this is an enduring threat and to um, make sure that we're unified and focused would be one of the most significant effects. And how is the lack of action over in the Senate and the lack of the reauthorization bill that we passed handcuffing, curtailing your efforts uh, in, in what you're trying to achieve for our nation right now? I think with a, a, a lack of um, authorization, um, we have many different uh, opinions and jurisdictions over what should be the priorities for our nation. And so it makes it more complicated to move for, forward cr crisply and clearly, um, especially with on both the authorization and on the appropriation side. Where do we put that next dollar um, towards, towards what risk and which way? It sounds to me like uh, there's a lack of certainty of what the future will hold for the agency unless Congress acts uh, to allow you to, to plan and prepare for the future. Yeah, it certainly, um, it, it does cause, uh, it's, not, it's a lack of clarity, definitely. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Director Ray, welcome, my fellow New Yorker. Um, Ranking, Ranking Member Thompson and, and my colleague from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry, was speaking about these crossing of the state lines for rioting and, and the matters that you're facing now. I'm always concerned about people using disguise and masks like they did at the Berkeley riots, uh, preventing their identity from being uh, revealed to, uh, to, to law enforcement. Um, we, we are a, a legislative body that is charged with creating laws to help you protect our nation. And I've always asked um, witnesses at, at hearings, what tools do you need? What could this committee do? What, what could Congress do uh, to, to aid the, the brave agents that work for you? The, the, what laws would you like to see us create that will help you protect, address some of these things, like people crossing state lines for rioting, uh, enhancing federal sentencing for that, uh, disguising their identities during these riots. I know there's some local laws. I was a prosecutor. I was the elected DA, uh, one of the five DAs of New York City for 12 years. Um, what, what, what could we do for you to help you in the efforts to protect our nation and, and our families? But needless to say, Congressman, that's a question I'd love to answer for hours. Uh, uh, so I appreciate the question. I think uh, looking down at the clock with the 45 seconds remaining, the thing I would say more than anything else, uh, I would urge every member of this committee to support reauthorization of Section 702 and not to erode the important tool that we have there. Just to give some context, the reason why that is so important the FBI's ability to query its own database, which is what 702 allows us to do, is picture a situation where some person in this country buys a huge amount of hydrogen peroxide. Nothing wrong with that, necessarily. But we know hydrogen peroxide is a precursor for terrorist attacks. Of course, it can also be used for other things. So if the merchant sends the FBI a tip that, hey, somebody bought an unusual amount of hydrogen peroxide, here's the email address for it. Right now, under 702, the FBI agent doing a national security investigation can run that email address, and if it turns out that that person is in contact with a known ISIS recruiter overseas, suddenly that purchase becomes a lot more important, and we can mobilize the scarce resources we've talked about in a way to make that a priority. If 702 is eroded, we lose that ability and we make people less safe. So there are a lot of tools I think we could add. But right now, I'm very focused on not losing the one that we need and that we have already. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you again for your service. And by the way, Bill Sweeney is a great <coughs> sack in New York. Unless you're going to promote him, leave him there, okay? Thank you. Chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Thompson for holding this important hearing. One of the very important uh, purposes of this committee is to assess and address all threats posed to our country. Uh, given that the ISIS-style attack in Charlottesville by white supremacists, I asked this committee to hold a hearing on white supremacist terrorism. In February of 2015, the Department of Homeland Security issued an intelligence assessment warning that sovereign citizen extremist ideology uh, would prompt violence across the U.S. In May of 27, the Joint Intelligence Bulletin produced by the FBI and the Department of Homeland Security stated that white supremacists were responsible for 49 homicides in 26 attacks from 2000 to 2016, more than any other domestic extreme movement. We must not take our eyes off the ball in regards to threats posed to our country. We were unprepared for 911, and there's no excuse if we're not prepared for another large-scale attack like that of Oklahoma City. And with that being said, I want to thank the FBI, the other agencies. I've got a New York Times article from August that says, bombing plot in Oklahoma City is stopped with the arrest, FBI says. This individual is looking to take out many, many people. And it says here, Mr. Vernell espoused an anti-government ideology and had expressed an interest in carrying out an attack that would echo the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City of April 1995 that killed almost 170 people. So thank you very much for that very good work to you and the other agencies. Um, Director Ray and Acting Secretary Duke, um, as you know, Congress passed Senate Joint Resolution 49 that was signed by the President in September. Uh, it condemned the racist violence and domestic terror attacks in Charlottesville and urged the President and the administration to use all available resources to address the growing prevalence, prevalence, I should say, of domestic terrorist groups. My questions are, are you uh, in your organizations doing anything differently since this resolution was signed? Um, we support the FBI strongly. I think what we've done um, recently is make sure that we're doing the training and the information sharing with the state and local governments. Um, we believe that with both domestic terrorism and homegrown violent extremists, two different groups, but they're both decentralized, and we need the state and local governments, especially the local, um, to be on part. So we're working closely. Acting Secretary, you mentioned earlier as well that there was a blurring of lines between domestic and international activity. So following up on your coordination of locals, do you also, have you put that same effort, will you put that same effort in coordinating with our allies and our neighbors to the north and to the south? Your predecessor here in this committee said if those threats get to the border, we've essentially lost the fight. So what are we doing to make sure that these terrorist threats don't get even close to our borders? The most important thing is information sharing a partner. We need to know about them early on before they board planes, before they move. Um, so are you working with our allies and our absolutely. neighbors to the north and south? North and south and also the EU um, uh, and, and other European countries. But definitely Canada, Mexico, the Northern Triangle, and South America. Sir? Uh, so on the uh, white supremacist threat in particular, in the wake of Charlottesville, we had a, um, a, a conference call with all of the SACs, you know, from around the country, uh, trying to make sure that they had learned, they could learn from the experience in Charlottesville in particular, and people were pooling uh, ideas and information about things they were seeing. We have uh, JTTFs in every um, field office. Uh, and they are uh, they have that as one of their uh, specific areas of focus So I would ask both of you um, Are you doing anything different in terms of following databases updating databases? Uh, trying to track white supremacist groups in the US compared as to the efforts you would put to track ISIS style terrorists that are threatening our citizens I believe both of those groups pose equal threats, an American citizen that loses their life to a terrorist attack, whether it's motivated by ISIS or it's motivated by white supremacists, doesn't matter, it's still a 
tragedy in our society, in our country. So are you doing anything to refocus to make sure that these white supremacist groups are being followed and being monitored as you would any other group? One of the major things we've done very recently is open the Office of Terrorism Prevention Partnerships, which is making sure every piece of information we get, the state and local governments have, to be at the point to, um, to notice and, and, and deal with any types of, of hate crimes in these groups. And, and training and information sharing is two of our major efforts. Uh, we have stepped up investigative interest, but we do not, uh, as I think uh, you may know, we do not, on the domestic terrorism front, investigate uh, groups in the same way. In other words, because of the First Amendment issues and the freedom of expression issues and the somewhat uh, ugly history that the FBI has had in the past, we have very specific rules on the domestic terrorism front where in order to open an investigation, there has to be uh, you know, credible evidence of federal crime, threat of force or violence to further a political or social goal. And if we have all those three things, then we open an, a very aggressive investigation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm out of time, but I'd like to ask unanimous consent to submit this statement for the record. It's uh, by Dr. Errol Southerns from the University of Southern California. It's a statement, worldwide threats keeping America secure in the new age of terrorism. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Chair Thank recognizes you. the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Ray, thank you for your service to your country, and I specifically thank you for, for bringing up the importance of 702 as an invaluable tool uh, for your investigative services in defense of our nation. I'm a strong supporter of it and shall be a vocal voice as the debates move forward. Um, please describe in at least general terms, what programs the FBI currently implements to monitor potentially seditious activity inside U.S. mosques and Islamic centers known to be affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood or other Islamic est extremist organizations? Uh, well, uh, Congressman, we investigate... Um, International terrorism matters, uh, global jihadi-inspired, directed um, matters, and we will follow them wherever they may lead. And in some cases, that may lead to specific individuals. And if they are in a mosque uh, and we're investigating them, then we would continue the investigation there. Do you monitor the, the advertised uh, appearances of known radical imams that speak uh, at Islamic centers across the country. I ask this specifically because a, a known radical imam spoke in my district recently and I uh, was completely under the radar. No media, no law enforcement knowledge. Uh, I found out from my own informant that, uh, that he appeared within my district and spoke. So I'm wondering, does the FBI monitor uh, the, the websites and social media announcements of the movements and the appearances of known radicalized uh, jihadist imams. We, we certainly have a variety of social media exploitation efforts underway that are focused on the kind of problem you're describing. Um, and we also have, in some cases, predicated, properly predicated investigations of specific subjects. Uh, and in some cases, that those have been uh, even imams. There have been cases where we've uh, pursued a matter that even led to, you know, arrest, indictment, and conviction. Um, I know that, I think back to one of my prior time in, in government, uh, in the Justice Department, uh, there was the case against Abu Hamza, for example, who was a very active uh, cleric in that space. Um, but so again, we that's given an example of the kind of thing we do. And, and just uh, quickly within this uh, non-classified setting, would your investigative efforts include human assets? Absolutely, and I appreciate you bringing that up because one of the things that I think is increasingly important with all the kind of um, challenges that we've described, all three of us have described in the terrorism arena, is the ability to use human sources. Yes, sir. Um, and we need to be able to work with the communities uh, around the country 
to be able to, to uh, get people to come forward because when you have somebody who's radicalized in a very short period of time in some cases, the best hope we have of finding out before the person commits a, an attack and kills somebody is to have somebody speak up and talk to law enforcement. And so it's important that we earn the confidence of the community in order to be able to generate human sources, and that's a, a very high priority. Thank you, sir. And 702 enhances your ability to use human assets. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, Secretary Duke, thank you for your service to your country, madam. I have one question. The U.S. electric grid is dangerously unsecured against the threat of electromagnetic pulse based on a nuclear explosion. Um, can you, within this setting, please explain what steps the Department of Homeland Security is taking to secure the U.S. electric grid on an expedited basis and further uh, what can this committee and this body do to assist in that effort? Yeah, this is a uh, relatively new threat that we've been looking at um, in our um, critical infrastructure sector. We have a strategy that will be uh, completed uh, before the end of this calendar year, uh, late, uh, late in December, and um, we'll be sharing that strategy that will help us start to uh, better address the EMP threat along with the uh, geomagnetic disturbance threat. And, and you have a, a study that will be concluded by the end of this year? Yes, it's, um, the target date is December 23rd currently. And, and you will share that with this committee? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Ms. Uh, Watson Coleman. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for your testimony and for your service. Um, one of the types of far-right extremism that is particularly concerning to me has to do with the anti-abortion uh, movement and their willingness to engage in uh, very dangerous um, act actions to express their uh, position. And so with that, I would seek unanimous consent to enter a statement for the record from the Feminist Majority uh, Foundation, Keeping America Secure in the New Age of Terror. Without objection, so order. Thank you very much. Um, I have a series of questions, some of which I really, really would like quick, quick answers to. Thank you. Um, this is for you, uh, Secretary Duke, and for you, Director Ray, because both of you mentioned the importance of information sharing with our foreign um, allies. Um, could you just elaborate on why that's so significant as quickly as possible? Because we need to know about people and be able to vet them before they move towards the United States. Uh, and I would add to that that in many cases, people are crossing either crossing borders themselves to commit attacks or communicating across borders or at a minimum uh, facing similar issues in those countries and in ours, so we have to compare notes. Thank you, Director. So it's really important that we at least maintain this open communication with people that we have had relationships with that we could trust that would share this information. Um, so having said that, do you think that uh, the President's tweets, tweets regarding the British Prime Minister's um, the British Prime Minister's help um, further that cooperation or I, impair that cooperation? I, I work with the Home Secretary of, um, of Great Britain and, and have a very good relationship and um, focus on that rather than speaking on tweets. Well, in dealing with our, our allies, do you find that there's any concern on their part with regard to uh, how quickly the President will tweet information that is not accurate, including the most recent ones regarding the far right, supposedly anti-Muslim groups. My personal experience is that they're anxious to work with us for the threats that Director Ray made, and so just work on building those towards the mission. Would you characterize those tweets helpful or not? Uh, my experience is similar to Secretary Duke's. Uh, I was, in fact, I was just over in the UK uh, less than about 10 days ago um, and met with all my British counterparts and I think the relationship was very strong and productive. Well, let's hope so. Um, Director Ray, you had expressed a, a strong desire that we reauthorize 702, Section 702, and that it's very vital for you all to be able to do their job. I wanted to just say that um, I, I had tremendous pause 
uh, when I read the report on um, black identity extremism um, and its threat to law enforcement. I still have very, very major concerns about what it communicates to law enforcement, what to fear, whether or not those fears have been developed in terms of the research and the analysis. Look forward to meeting with those analysts to discuss what seems to be a very skimpy report. But that kind of gives me pause to support that kind of authorization to an agency that would, I think, allow this sort of poorly developed um, report to come out and not demonstrate, in my opinion, only in my opinion, a, um, I, I guess, a commensurate um, identification or expression of white identity extremism that pre presents a threat to our environment. Uh, I would just add, I, I appreciate our conversation yesterday. And, and, I and I'm sorry that I had to leave before it was completed. But I, 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 but I found it a candid and hopefully constructive conversation. I look forward to continuing the dialogue on, on that issue. I would say on the white supremacist issue, uh, we do put out information to state and local law enforcement on that. And in fact, at the IACP conference uh, recently in Philadelphia that I attended and spoke at, we distributed, I think, something like 15,000 copies of a video, which I'd be happy to make available to you, about white supremacist, the white supremacist threat to state and local law enforcement to raise their awareness of that, of that threat. And that's an example, but it's hardly the only example. I think it's really important, and I know it's a difficult discussion for us to have, but I need to agree with my colleague, Mr. Correa, that if we're really going to look at the dangers that are confronting our safety and security of our citizens here in the homeland, that we need to have a serious discussion of uh, who represents that danger. And while we talk about this on the surface and we kind of skim and we include it in the larger discussions on very important issues of homeland security, in and of itself, the, the threat is so severe that even organizations who've done research on these issues find that the threat to our security is greater with these org groups than it is with these sort of foreign fighters or, you know, uh, foreign inspired um, and individuals, and we just need to confront this. So on the record, I need to ask again that we have a hearing specifically addressing those issues with those members of the administration that, have, that weigh in, work on, and have consideration of these issues. So I thank you, and I see that I've gone beyond my time, so Mr. Chairman, I read. Uh, Gentlemen, yields. Uh, chair recognizes a former FBI agent uh, from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you all uh, for being here. And more importantly, thank you for what you do. Um, your work is not easy. We know that, and we're here to support you in any way necessary. Um, and I can report to this committee uh, regarding Director Ray, uh, who's leading my former organization. Uh, I've spoken and obviously keep in touch with many of my former colleagues from the ground all the way up. Uh, this is a man that they have come to respect tremendously. So, uh, Mr. Ray, thank you for leading the organization that I love. Um, I think that um, it warrants further discussion regarding Section 702. Mr. Higgins brought it up briefly. Um, and I want this committee to be fully aware, um, not only of what you just said regarding the benefits to the Bureau and to the national security apparatus regarding 702, but I think what I'd like you to address briefly, sir, is the consequences of not reauthorizing. What would we not be able to do any more should Section 702 expire? So the, the real value of 702 to the FBI and to the protection of the American people is at the front end, at the very early stages, when a tip comes in. And we're in an environment right now, for, as you've heard from every member of this panel, where there's a high volume of threats. And there are so few dots, in many cases, to connect with these smaller, more contained, more loosely organized situation so that the premium on getting the right dots to connect to understand which threats are real, which ones are more aspirational, that's when the value of 702 kicks in. It, right now, under 702, we can query information, and I want to be sure everybody understands this, is information that the FBI has already lawfully in its possession. There's no court that disagrees with that. Uh, and right now, they can query that information and know that this tip from state local law enforcement or somebody in the private sector 
is one that really matters and allows us to mobilize resources to be sure that we get in front of the threat. If the 702 is walked back, we will in effect be starting to rebuild the wall that existed before 9-11. And I, I implore the committee not to go there again because that is something that we learned the hard way before, you know, before and after 9-11. Thank you, Mr. Ray. And um, we have a lot of people on this committee asking what, what we can do to help. Uh, this is Exhibit A of where we can help. We have to reauthorize Section 702. It is absolutely imperative. Um, Secretary Duke, um, I had the, the honor of uh, visiting Puerto Rico last week. Um, as you know, this committee is oversight over FEMA. Um, I describe the experience as heartbreaking and heartwarming all uh, at the same time. Um, walking through the um, convention center where some amazing work is being done uh, by a great team of federal agencies who have challenges. Um, my concern is, and if you could address this, um, FEMA is spread very thin right now. Uh, they're responding in Texas, they're responding in Florida, and they're also responding to what I believe to be the most challenging situation in Puerto Rico. Uh, logistically being over a thousand miles off the coast of Florida. Uh, they had an antiquated infrastructure and uh, electrical grid to begin with, um, and they dealt with a Cat 5 hurricane right through the island. Um, 190 mile an hour sustained winds for a 12 hour period of time. The uh, citizens there described it to me as a 12 hour long tornado. It was absolutely devastating. What are we doing specifically for Puerto Rico given the unique challenges logistically and economically that uh, those people face because I think it's important that we constantly talk about and remind everybody that they are American citizens too. Right. Um, yeah, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands definitely had some unique challenges. The main thing we're doing differently is I'll juxtapose it against Texas, where Governor Abbott had a strong infrastructure in place, both physical infrastructure and a people, um, to lead the effort, and we augmented. What we've done in Puerto Rico, because of their uh, financial con concerns and others, Governor Rosello had um, a weak um, ability to execute uh, his vision. So we have embedded FEMA people with the governor and are bolstering uh, his vision, his recovery efforts even more strongly. Additionally, we're doing response and recovery simultaneously. So we are continuing response. Even though it's tailed off, we are still delivering water, still delivering me meals, but we're actually doing the recovery efforts um, in terms of rebuilding the infrastructure. So I would say a much stronger role um, in, in supporting the governor. We appreciate it, and please keep the focus on Puerto Rico. We don't want them to be forgotten, and anything this committee can do uh, to support that role, please let us know. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. To recognize the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Longevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank our witnesses for your testimony today. Um, before I begin, Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent uh, to submit the uh, 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 a statement from the uh, START, uh, the, the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism and Responses to Terrorism. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so uh, with uh, to Director Ray and um, Secretary Duke, um, for both of you, uh, in your testimony, you reference uh, two major cybersecurity incidents this year, WannaCry and NotPetya. Uh, under the, the National Cyber Incident Response Plan, uh, when a significant cyber incident occurs, uh, the Department of Justice acting through the FBI uh, is the lead agency for threat response, and DHS is the lead agency for asset response. So can you and uh, Director Ray describe uh, how uh, your two agencies collaborated uh, in response to these incidents and, and your lessons learned, and how do you see the cyber threat uh, evolving and what gaps do you see in U.S. defenses and response and recovery efforts? Well, I think the main division um, is that DHS is responsible for securing the systems and remediating any ma malware. So we're on, we're on the, the technical side of addressing the threat, such as WannaCry. Um, we are embedded with the FBI in their National Cyber uh, Joint Task Force, um, and then we have our own NCAG. I think that um, what what we are having to do is really understand, as the director said earlier, the difference between state actors 
just persons looking for maybe financial gain and those hybrid actors, and that's become much more difficult. Um, and I think just information sharing and the co-location is huge for us working together in the future. I would just add that uh, just as the DHS has the lead in asset protection and asset mitigation, the FBI has the lead in threat response, which we understand to mean sort of the pursuit and the attribution uh, and the investigation of the incident. Uh, and I've been encouraged by how much progress has been made about the cooperation between DHS and FBI on this issue. It's, it's been a challenge for everybody because it's such an evolving, challenging technical area. Um, but because of the various interagency task forces that exist, and there are ones that are both at the policy coordination level that are sort of standing, and then there are specific ones that get stood up in response to a significant cyber incident. And I think the better we get, and we need to keep getting better at information sharing and, and kind of cooperation, and including involving the private sector wherever possible, um, I think that's how we're going to ultimately get in front of the threat. And, and gaps in particular? I think one of the biggest gaps is that the role that critical infrastructure plays in in this issue in protecting our country. So as the director said, having to involve um, the, the private industry in key critical infrastructure sectors. Okay. So uh, Secretary Duke, um, uh, while uh, model aircraft have been available to the general consumer for decades, the injection of precision navigation and simple to use control uh, interfaces as rapidly uh, expanded the user base of unmanned aerial vehicles. Combined with the, uh, the capability to carry small payloads, uh, such as improvised explosives, these devices now uh, can be used to commit acts of terror, sadly. Uh, so I've worked with uh, my colleague, Senator Whitehouse, uh, from Rhode Island, uh, to introduce legislation criminalizing uh, the reckless operation of drones, but that in and of itself cannot uh, stop committed to violent actors. So uh, how is DHS assessing the rapid increase in the uh, quantities and capabilities of small UAVs uh, and the potential to be used uh, as an attack vector. And in case my, uh, my time doesn't run out, uh, Director Ray, um, as you note in your testimony, integrating intelligence is the critical st uh, strategic pillar of the FBI strategy. I want to thank you uh, for your efforts in this, uh, in this domain. Uh, in the international space, the U.S. provides a significant amount of intelligence to our foreign partners that enables them to better protect their, uh, their own nations from attacks. Can you uh, and uh, Director Rasmussen comment on how these partners uh, are reciprocating uh, in information sharing and what can be done to improve this cooperation? A quick answer on the unmanned aircraft systems. This is an area where we lack authority. And if there's anything I would ask of the committee, it would be to assist us in getting authority. We can't even do testing of anti-UAS systems with our current authorities. And we think this is a major increasing threat. On the uh, f foreign uh, cooperation point, uh, one of the things that we're doing better now that's, I think, significantly improved the amount of intelligence flowing back the other way is through our LEGAT program. We have LEGATs in, you know, 80, 80 LEGATs serving 200 countries. That's our, our foreign uh, offices of the FBI. And a lot of those, I just was, came back from Europe in particular where we're starting to get more and more two-way flow of information, uh, in particular from the Brits, but also from other countries. Uh, as they learn more about what would be valuable and we get more and more embedded in the level of trust both ways between the two countries uh, matures, uh, I think it's, that's another place where when I look at the kind of cooperation that exists now between intelligence services and the way it was back when I was in government before, it's like night and day. Uh, it doesn't mean it can't be better and it needs to keep getting better, but I really feel like we're on the right track there. Thank you. I would just add to that that if there was any modest silver lining in the, the difficult threat environment that we faced driven by ISIS over the last few years. It's been the dramatic increase in information sharing globally that we've seen. Many more countries than ever before view this as their problem too and simply not something that they can shut off and ignore and, and say that's an American problem or that's a British problem. And so the, the array, the, the number of countries that we have active intelligence sharing arrangements with is, is in the many, many dozen now rather than just a handful of very close partners. Uh, and again, the foreign fighter phenomenon, ha phenomenon has also helped drive that kind of information sharing as well. So it's a modest silver lining, but it's something we can build on for, for, for the range of terrorism threats that we'll face in the future. I want to thank you all for your, for your testimony, your insights. And uh, Secretary Duke, uh, 
I think it's pretty outrageous that uh, the DHS can't even do testing uh, on these uh, on the on, uh, on drones and their capabilities. And uh, Mr. Chairman, maybe that's something that we can work on together to help to change. Uh, yeah, and if the uh, gentleman, I, I I've been looking at this issue for quite some time. We've seen drones being used in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we've seen drones at the White House, the Capitol. Um, I do think it's time for us to consider legislation uh, to move some authorities from the FAA to the Department of Homeland Security. And I, I would uh, very much like to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd welcome the opportunity. Uh, with that, thank you to our witnesses, and I'll yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, the gentleman from Nebraska, General Bacon, is recognized for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is an honor to be on the committee <laughs> defending our Constitution and strengthening our national security are my most important priorities. And it's an honor to be on this committee to, to put some focus on that. Uh, Secretary Duke, I wanted to ask you about what I consider is one of the most important threats to our country, and that's the cyber penetration from Russia and China into our energy infrastructure, our perhaps our financial networks. How would you assess the threat that Russia and China poses say on a one to 10 scale, 10 being the worst. Because what I fear is the next December 7th we face will be preceded by a energy attack or a financial sector attack like that. Thank you. It, it, is, it is very strong. On a scale to one to 10, I would say uh, probably a seven or an eight because what we know is uh, daunting and we don't know what we don't know. But uh, looking at um, using cyber to attack the control systems of critical infrastructure is a major uh, area of concern that we're working with the critical infrastructure on. It seems apparent to me that they're putting that foundation in to have that capability if needed. You know, I think we should be concerned. And do you think we're doing enough to build resilience in the system or to have backups? Or, or is there a lot more that we can do? I, th I think that it's to the point where um, the critical infrastructure sec sector has really recognized the threat recently. So I think um, everyone has the attention. Now it's implementing um, the safeties to, to help try to prevent this. Okay. Thank you. Director Ray, when I go and talk to the law enforcement in the Omaha area, I ask what is the one thing that we can do more to help you with gun violence and things like that? And I hear two things. Do more about straw man purchases not enough being done there, and also to help off-duty law enforcement to be able to carry their weapons or retired. Would you share those sentiments from our, our law enforcement from Omaha? Uh, well, certainly on the, uh, the straw purchasing side, uh, when I was a line prosecutor back, I used to, as a baby prosecutor, I used to do a lot of straw purchaser cases. Uh, and I do think that's a place where more aggressive enforcement of the laws on the books would be very helpful. Most of that responsibility lies with ATF, mm -hmm. uh, but we work collaboratively with the ATF, who's a great partner on more organized criminal activity that involves some of the same kind of firearms uh, crime that you're talking about. And as you may know, the Attorney General is revitalizing uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods that was a very effective uh, federal, state, and local uh, program that existed in the early 2000s that kind of built off of Project Exile that had been in Richmond to really try to more strategically focus on gun violence. So I think that'll help the, the folks in Omaha, among other places. Thank you. Uh, we're going to be working on some legislation towards that end. Thank you. Director Rasmussen, as you know, Secretary of Defense Mattis has changed our strategy. When we get to an area where ISIS is operating, our policy previously been to take over a city, but they would be able to get out, retreat, regroup somewhere else. Now his strategy is to kill, kill them where they're at and not let them get out. Are you seeing effects of the strategy where we're seeing less of these terrorists leaving Syria, trying to come back this direction or going to Europe? Are you seeing a re reduction in this terrorist flow? Well, certainly the, the territorial aspect of the fight that I mentioned in my prepared remarks um, has accelerated over the course of, of this year that with the dramatic reduction in the amount of territory ISIS controls. One of the difficulties and challenges, though, has been that that campaign has taken a period of time to play out. In a sense, mm -hmm. the, the bad guys, in many cases, knew where we were headed next. They knew that the effort was focused on Mosul, the largest city in Iraq that was under ISIS control. They knew we were, over time, going to move towards Raqqa, uh, the city in eastern Syria that, that served as a headquarters for ISIS. That, unfortunately, allowed many of the actors we would be most concerned about to, to bleed out over mm -hmm. time ahead of that campaign. Um, many chose to fight. To, to stay and fight, and they chose to stay and fight and die 
in defense of the caliphate, but others we are concerned about have made their way into either the Iraqi countryside or are trying to find their way out of the conflict zone. So it's not necessarily a volume question as much as it is a quality and quantity question. Mm -hmm. If the wrong individuals get out, the wrong individuals who have particular capability or skill, uh, an experience with weapons of mass destruction, um, those are the ones we are the most concerned about. So, but yes, I agree. We are absolutely focused on making sure these individuals do not escape the battlefield. Right. One last question, if I may. I think we're doing a lot on the kinetic side, going into the cyber mode for recruitment, going after the financials <coughs> end of it. But I've yet to see how we can do better at undermining the ideology that rec recruits lone wolves to help sustain ISIS and Al-Qaeda overseas. What more can we be doing to undermine the ideology that uh, does this recruiting? I think there a, a soft touch and a little bit of subtlety is required because I think we, we will be most effective if, if we are enabling and empowering credible actors who's, who can speak credibly to those potentially vulnerable populations rather than something coming out from the State Department or with the brand of the United States on it saying, this is how you should behave, this is how you should believe. But if we can identify and empower and support credible voices within the communities where this is a problem, it's a better solution. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen, yield to Director Ray, I just want to count, and in addition to doing counterterrorism work as a federal prosecutor, I was also a exile prosecutor. And, I, and please relay uh, to the Attorney General my uh, thanks for reviving that program. It's, uh, it's a very good, it works. So thank you. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. I thank you, and, and let me start out by thanking each and every one of you for your service to this nation. My time is short, and so I will be pointed in my questions. Uh, Secretary Duke, uh, let me first of all offer my sympathy publicly, again, as I've done, uh, for the loss of life as a Border Patrol agent just a few weeks ago, and as well, uh, one that is injured and mending. And thank you for all the men and women that work in the Homeland Security Department. Let me focus on uh, Hurricane Harvey, which by um, connection, uh, I think it impacts the Virgin Islands and as well Puerto Rico uh, and Florida and others. Um, FEMA certainly is an agency that uh, we owe a great debt of gratitude to. Uh, but let me be very clear. I've been asked how Houston is doing, how Texas is doing. We're a strong group of people, but we are devastated. Uh, and it is so difficult dealing with FEMA and the repeated denials, people who have not heard from FEMA. FEMA is good for the immediacy, but it is not good for recovery. And you're listed as a recovery agency. We need help down in Texas. Uh, we need more uh, FEMA DRCs. We need more people dealing with the uh, appeal process. It is absolutely absurd. The second question is uh, dealing with the appropriations. Uh, I would ask that you would ask the President of the United States to consider that $44 billion is shameful. Uh, the President came to Texas and said that we would provide you with everything you need. This is $44 billion for the U.S. Virgin Islands, for Puerto Rico, Texas, and everyone else. So if you would answer that question uh, after, let me go to Director Ray. Um, I'll put the questions on the record very quickly. Uh, the questions on the record are, uh, Director Bay, as you well know, there have been some anti-Muslim videos that have been offered by the Commander-in-Chief. My question is, as the world has um, condemned this, how difficult it makes the work of the FBI that deals with domestic terrorism with these kinds of videos being associated with the United States. Uh, second, I'm interested in the commitment to not do reverse targeting under 702. I know that it's uh, an international issue, but the FBI is involved in terrorism. Uh, in the fight against terrorism and may use the 702 um, law. And I want to know your, your position on reverse targeting of a U.S. citizen. Uh, finally, um, the black identity extremists, we've had some conversations on that. Um, I believe it is crucial that there be a clarification uh, so that uh, individuals expressing themselves under the First Amendment understand the parameters of the FBI. Uh, Ms. Duke, uh, if you would please, Secretary Duke. I, I will uh, check into the specific inquiries. I'll work with uh, Governor Abbott's office to make sure that we're getting, we're keeping uh, in Texas. The 44 billion is the current supplemental. We do expect that there will be needed uh, additional supplementals, but for now, we do have adequate resources um, to do all the recovery efforts. I vigorously disagree with you. We do not have the adequate resources, uh, and this is going to be 
uh, on the verge of a government shutdown if Texas and all of the other victims of these hurricanes do not have a compromise where we can work together. I would encourage you to tell the President that it is not enough. It simply is not. May I also just leave with you uh, Ms. Timotope M. Jimmo, J-I-M-O-H, uh, who is a United Airlines supervisor who has not been able to determine uh, why she has been uh, denied um, uh, an official background check. She's filed two appeals, so I'd like to speak with your Ledge Affairs on that. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Director Ray, thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, on the, if I can take your questions in rapid fire fashion here, Thanks. the uh, the first one, I, I think we try very hard at the FBI and will continue to try very hard to earn the trust and confidence of every community we serve and protect, including the Muslim American community. And we are trying, as I mentioned in response to an earlier question, to encourage people to come forward uh, as potential sources and witnesses, and we will continue to do that. On the uh, reverse targeting point, uh, my position is there should not be, and we do not permit reverse targeting under Section 702. And on the black identity extremist issue, I thought our conversation yesterday was candid and constructive. At least I hope you felt the same way. Um, I can assure you and the rest of the American people that we do not investigate people for rhetoric, for ideology, for First Amendment expression, for association. What we do is it, when people are engaged in, when there's credible evidence of federal crime involving the threat, credible threat of force or violence to further a political or social goal, that's our focus. We have no interest in investigating any group for expressing strong views, no matter who might consider them extremist, uh, about any important social issue, including racial injustice. Did you answer that last question? I got nine seconds. Uh, about 702? Oh, I'm sorry. On 702, I, I was just saying uh, we do not permit reverse targeting and would not. Thank you so very much. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, first want to thank the panel for uh, your service to the country and particularly your service here this morning and this uh, long testimony. You know, there's an old saying that, that you know everybody uses, don't, don't beat a dead horse. And of course, then we turn right around and beat the dead horse. So uh, uh, Secretary Duke, I, I too am going to ask about the uh, OMB's recommendation of the 44 uh, billion for re storm recovery. And, and here's, here's the issue in Florida. Uh, we are a very large agricultural state. Uh, most people don't realize that. But, um, but we took a very hard hit, about 1.5 billion uh, in almost a hundred, uh, uh, almost 700 million of that was to our citrus industry. And this is why a supplemental to follow is not adequate because these, these citrus farmers need the money now for the next crop coming. And, and if they don't, if they don't have that, those assets right now, then they're not going to be prepared for, for the next growing season. I spoke with one, one citrus grower who lost 36,000 trees, 36,000 trees. Uh, that's going to take some time to replace, and more delays uh, is going to have a, a, a tremendous negative impact on, on our recovery in Florida. So I'd, I'd like you to carry that back to the administration and, and, uh, and, and the OMB. And, and let them know the impact that that's going to have on these growing seasons that don't wait for the next supplemental. Uh, so th thank you for that. And now I'd like to shift over to uh, and follow up on cyber, as, as many of my colleagues have. And, and uh, you know, not just, not just asset protection, but also the ideological uh, fight that I think needs to go on within the w within the cyber war and and Director Ray, you, you mentioned the the cyber squads that you have now in all 56 uh, regional offices and and uh, what what I'd like to know is what what are the difficulties you know one of the challenges I think in in the in the world of cyber is getting that great talent uh, and and being able to pay for it and pull them away from. Uh, you know, private industry. How, how, is there anything that we can do to help you get the best of the best uh, for your cyber war? 
Well, I, I was, as you started to ask the question, I was thinking before you got to the talent, that was going to be my answer as the principal challenge. Um, there's just not enough people who really have that um, for a genius level talent uh, for anybody, including the private mm -hmm. sector. Uh, and of course, we can't compete with the hefty paychecks that the private sector can offer those same people. But I do believe that people, uh, we can compete with anybody on mission. And I think we have found that the bright young talent that we're able to attract in the space join us for the right reasons, which is their commitment to the mission. We clearly need more of them. Uh, we're trying to do more to, to, ra to raise the level of what I will call sort of cyber literacy across our workforce, because one of the things that we struggle with right now is that our sort of cyber black belts, if you can call them that, mm -hmm. get diverted into having to help out with other kinds of criminal investigation work that has a cyber component. But if we could raise the basic level of literacy across the organization, and I assume Secretary Duke would say the same thing within hers, uh, then we could really have the most talented people focus on the really sophisticated cutting edge mm -hmm. stuff. And that's where I'm hoping to take the organization. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you, you, you referenced uh, Homeland Security, because I, I know the Secret Service, for example, had some great success in, in going after uh, transnational organizations with money laundering and those kind of things. And, uh, and it's important to have that, that cyber uh, attack. Uh, Director Asmussen, uh, how, how, about, how about you? Is there anything, you know, what can we do to help you all with, the, with, these recru with this recruiting? Anything? Well, it, it, Director Ray made a very good point. With the mission that we have before us, whether it's counterterrorism or dealing with cyber crime or cyber threats to the United States, Motivating young people to want to do this for a living is not a challenge. When we put, oh, we put out announcements for, for you know, job openings, we get hundreds and hundreds of very high-quality applicants from all over the country. One of the challenges we're facing in the intelligence community is getting them through the security clearance process quickly enough mm -hmm. so that we don't make someone wait 18 months to start embarking on their federal career, and that's something we're working on internally. Yeah. But I would tell you the, the, the biggest thing I think you could give us as all federal agencies, is a predictable funding environment so that we didn't have to wonder year to year, will I be able next year to have an entry-level cadre of young people coming in, or am I stuck with this year's class and I have to hold, hold on to them uh, that much longer? So year-to-year -year predictability is very, very important. Yes, and, and let me ask one other thing uh, in a little bit of time I have left. Uh, the National Cyber Incident Response Plan as was mentioned earlier, DHS is responsible for the asset uh, response, but FBI and DOJ responsible for the for the threat response. Uh, what is the involvement of, of private industry in, in that partnership and in, in response? And and uh, do, do we need some further clarification and definition of, of roles in, in this cyber war? I would say that while there was a time when the definition was murkier and there were more more confusion about the lanes in the road, that after PPD 41, the lanes in the road, I think, are much more Straight, clearly okay. defined. Um, so I haven't seen as much of that as an issue. I think the private sector engagement piece is something that we and DHS work on together a lot more and more. Uh, we're always trying to figure out ways to balance the desire to get with the private sector faster, but at the same time to make sure we're both providing accurate information uh, and that we're not compromising an existing investigation. And in many cases, the information that we're getting, on the, at least on the FBI side, is either classified or involves coordination with our foreign partners, as I said mm -hmm. you know, earlier, and there may be restrictions on our ability to share it. So we're, we're all learning collectively, the interagency community and the private sector, about how to kind of adapt to this you know, comparatively new threat still. Okay. Well, well, again, thank all of you for your time. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Uh, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member, for uh, having this meeting. And thank you, Director Ray, for the meeting yesterday, which was um, very thorough and I hope we continue to, to follow up. Let me just ask you all, and, and maybe Director uh, Rasmussen or uh, Director Ray would have more insight. I'm concerned about the new and reemerging slave trade in Libya. And the question is, uh, 
have you all, do you all have any intelligence on it? Do you have any reason to believe that it is not, in fact, happening? Obviously, the, the fact that there is as much political chaos and a vacuum of authority in Libya opens the door to all kinds of criminal and other illicit activity. Human trafficking is, is obviously a component of that as, as, as or groups try to move individuals um, up through Libya and potentially into Europe and contribute to the migrant problem in, or migrant challenge in Europe. We follow that pretty closely from a terrorism perspective because those same networks can be used to move extremists who want to do us harm or do, do harm to our mm -hmm. allies and friends also. So we could arrange uh, to share some more, more classified information with you or your staff in terms of what we know about those challenges. Unfortunately, what we know and what we can do about it are two separate things. We don't have a lot of capability on the ground. Well, and, and I agree, but almost like in a medical situation, you first have to diagnose that there is a problem and acknowledge there's a problem. And I think that there's more that Congress can do. I just wanted to to know from experts whether it's something you all would say is fact, that That's, it's happening. It's certainly true. Okay. Um, and thank you uh, for that. Director Ray, and, and actually all of you all have employees that have to fill out the SF-86 form, and you talked about the process of 18 months to actually get through the process. But my question is, at what point, and, and maybe Director Ray as a former agent, you can comment on this, at what point do omissions become willful and deliberate omissions that rise to violating, I think it's Title 18, Section 1001, which is penalties for inaccurate or false statements on the security clearance form? Uh, well, first, uh, well, I would love to be able to claim having been a former agent. I can claim to be a former prosecutor. Um, and I, uh, so I wouldn't want any of my, the, many of the many agents who work for me to view me as a poser. Uh, but Got the, it. I'm very proud of my FBI credentials now, however. Um, uh, second, on the SF-86 point, um, you know, it's really, it's going to be dependent on all the facts and circumstances of the particular case. Um, you know, willfulness requires a, a level of conscious knowledge and intent, uh, a knowing falsehood and a, and a recognition that the person is um, uh, making a material omission or false statement and recognizing that that's what they're doing when they do it, I guess is the way I think of it. And that's layman speak, but, uh, and as you as a former uh, defense lawyer, I can, can appreciate some of the nuances there. And, and I guess if, if we look at the administration and, and take the most, uh, obvious example, which is Kushner's form that has been amended, you know, over a hundred times and usually after it comes to light that it was inaccurate. Uh, the question becomes people who apply to your agencies who may leave off, you know, high school eviction, or, you know, college eviction from apartment or something like that, who may get prosecuted for it. At what, at what point um, do we start to get to selective prosecution if we don't set the example at the top level with um, with willful omissions that don't get corrected until after they're brought to the public? Well, certainly I think it's important to respond truthfully and completely on an SF-86, and I would expect all my folks to, to do that. It is a, a bear of a form to fill out if you've ever seen one, um, and if the older you are and the more time periods you got to cover, uh, it is a challenge. Um, I'm not aware of a whole lot of prosecutions that have occurred of people for their SF-86 responses, um, but uh, but certainly I do think it's important to for everybody uh, at any level to try to be as truthful and complete and accurate as possible in filling out the SF-86. With my last 15 seconds, let me just thank you all for the job you do. And we know how complicated it is from how do we uh, secure drones or unmanned aircraft now, and uh, Mr. Higgins would relate. Uh, in my district, I probably have the largest petrochemical footprint in the country, and that is a concern of how we protect it from flying objects that can be directed. So uh, no one professes that what you do is easy, but we thank you for your service because the safety of the homeland depends on it. And for those people who work for you all, uh, please let them know that uh, this Congress, and I think I can speak for everybody, surely appreciates their service and sacrifice for the country. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back.
Gentleman yields. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Ratcliffe is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start off where my uh, friend and colleague from Louisiana left off, and that's uh, thanking our entire panel today. Um, uh, Director Rasmussen, let me just um, uh, tell you that I believe that our nation is safer and better because of your service, and I will just tell you that you will be missed. Um, Secretary Duke, um, as the chairman of the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Protection Subcommittee here, um, I have enjoyed working with you and I have appreciated your leadership on what I believe is our greatest national security threat in the long term, cybersecurity. Um, having said that, um, while I look forward to working with you, I have a limited time today. And while I believe that cybersecurity is our greatest national security threat, I believe that our most urgent national security threat right now relates to Section 702 that has been mentioned a number of times. And so let me turn to you, Director, um, Director Ray. Um, the reason I call 702 the most urgent national security matters, I think it's been mentioned that it's about to expire. We have nine legislative days left here in this Congress uh, before, it ex before the Section 702 of FISA expires at the end of the year. Now, it has been mentioned um, that 702, broadly speaking, uh, targets foreign intelligence uh, from non-U.S. persons reasonably believed to be uh, outside of the U.S. But quantifying exactly how important 702, I think, uh, has been left out of the, uh, some of the discussion, and I want to give you the opportunity uh, to expound on that or maybe refute it. Our uh, intelligence agencies estimate that 25 percent of our actionable uh, foreign intelligence comes directly from 702. Do you believe that to be accurate? I'm not sure that I know what the percentage is, but that doesn't surprise me, that estimate, uh, and I would have no reason to question it. I will tell you that every person I talk to who's actually seen the operation of Section 702 internally up close, and I've sat with agents at the terminal watching how they use it so that I could be sure that I was really understanding it, every single one of them is just horrified at the thought that we would lose that valuable tool. Well, let's assume our intelligence agencies are correct and 25 percent is an accurate number. Are you aware of any legal authority that would provide us a greater percentage of actionable foreign intelligence than Section 702? No. Okay. So we've established that it's very, very important to our national security. Now let's talk about how effective 702 really is. Um, I participated last week in a debate at the Judiciary Committee uh, as Congress moved forward and the Judiciary Committee moved forward something called the USA Liberty Act, which seeks to reauthorize but significantly modify 702. Um, in the course of that uh, discussion, I, I found some of the well-intentioned criticism to be misguided and unfair because uh, some folks are conflating um, Section 215 and telephony metadata with Section 702. Would you agree with me that those comparisons are misguided and unfair? Yes, I would. All right. So uh, one of the, I think, legitimate concerns and questions that's been raised about Section 702 relates to the issue of incidental collection uh, of information on Americans and even non-U.S. persons who are in the United States. Uh, we know that that happens. But again, I think what has been left out of much of the public debate, and I want to give you the opportunity to weigh in and clarify as, as we, members of Congress and the public, watch as this debate move forward, there is oversight of this incidental collection that takes place. It takes place through an oversight board, a nonpartisan board called the Privacy and Civil, Liber Civil Liberties Oversight Board, or PCLOB, correct? Correct. And PCLOB has actually issued a very specific report reviewing um, Section 702 and uh, the incidental collection that has taken place, correct? Correct. All right. And, uh, and to your knowledge, does that uh, report from an independent oversight board, has it found in the seven years that 702 has been in place, has it found any intentional abuse of Section 702? Not to my knowledge, no. Uh, over seven years, no intentional abuses of Section 702. I would think that that is essentially um, a record of success for a government authority that is unrivaled, certainly in my experience. So um, I guess in summary, you agree with me that 702 is our most important uh, law enforcement and counterintelligence uh, tool with respect to foreign uh, intelligence? Yes. And it's our most effective? Yes. And it's our least abused? Yes. 
And uh, given that, if we not only uh, uh, fail to reauthorize, but fail to reauthorize Section 702 in as close to as form as it possibly is right now, would we as members of Congress be jeopardizing national security for all 320 million Americans, as in your opinion, as America's top law enforcement official? That is definitely my view, and I appreciate uh, the question because I think when I talk about the importance of reauthorizing Section 702, it's exactly as you say, it's the importance of reauthorizing it in as close to the current form as possible. My time's expired. I thank you all. Thank you. Gentleman Yields, let me echo those sentiments. I, I believe reauthorization of 702 uh, as close as possible to current law is vitally important to the security of the United States. Uh, with that, the chair now recognizes um, Ms. Berrigan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Duke, thank you for being here today. Um, I just was last week visiting our troops overseas um, for Thanksgiving. I was in Afghanistan. I'm just amazed at how these young men and women are on the front lines of fighting terrorism, um, doing so with the mission of protecting our homeland. Earlier this year, um, I was disturbed to learn that um, if you are not a citizen in this country and you pick up a weapon and you go fight overseas and you die there, we will make you an automatic citizen. But if you survive and you come back to this country, you can still be deported. And um, when I was out there, I was talking to a few of, the, of our soldiers who were telling me about some of their um, concerns and their problems with family members who are going through proceedings. Can you tell me if any veterans are being deported right now under your watch? Um, I would have to get back to the record. I do know that DOD, uh, Department of Defense, is looking at reinstituting the program of uh, past for citizenships for sa soldiers. But um, in terms of recently returning veterans, I'd have to uh, get back. They are not a priority for sure. Okay, great. If you could do so in writing, I would appreciate that. Um, we, you know, I've been introduced a bill um, to address this so that we can just uh, make sure we are protecting those who are on the front lines and are serving. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the the hurricane um, Har Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Um, my understanding uh, from reports that I had read is that there was some confusion about um, in directives on whether immigration checkpoints were going to remain or not. Um, and so I wanted to, to ask if you were aware of the confusion that was created from the directives. We um, early on issued uh, that there would be no uh, active <coughs> immigration control that uh, other than criminal acts that needed to be addressed that we would not do uh, proactive immigration enforcement. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and enter into the record two articles um, covered by um, NPR and, and some other organizations that kind of highlighted the confusion uh, that caused uh, even the mayor, I think, of Houston to have to come out to go on record to make a statement about this. Um, I'm hoping that uh, this will be something that won't become an issue as uh, another, you know, emergency disaster happens because we want to certainly make sure that people feel safe and secure and in following authorities when they're being asked to, to leave. Um, and in that regard, I've introduced a bill on that. Um, hopefully my colleagues uh, will take a look at that. No, um, without objection, so ordered. Th thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up on some of the, the questions about uh, gun uh, gun violence really and their their connection to uh, uh, terrorism um, I think um, I remember hearing a former Homeland Security uh, Secretary Jay Johnson um, once made a, a comment and I'm going to quote him it said a meaningful responsible gun control is now part and parcel of a Homeland Security especially given the prospect of homegrown homeborn violent extremism in this country do you agree with that assessment? What, what we're seeing now is really a agnostic uh, look at tools. Um, and, and guns are not necessarily the primary um, vehicle by which uh, terrorism is occurring. Uh, well, uh, would you say that uh, the guns are part of uh, what terrorists are using and that it certainly could be perceived as uh, access to guns could be part of the issue? Guns, knives, vehicles are uh, among the top, yes. Great, thank you. Um, Director Ray, um, I, I uh, wanted to ask you, um, you know, I have to first agree with some of my colleagues who echoed, um, you know, having more hearings on on um, the threats presented by domestic terrorism and homegrown terror. Um, I 
also um, wrote a letter to the chairman asking that we do a hearing just on that. And instead, it's it's harder to, to get to all these issues with with a short amount of time. Um, but Director Ray, terrorists are getting their hands on and using high assault weapons. Um, it's a repeated occurrence costing American lives. We've seen it happen in San Bernardino, in Orlando, at the Pulse nightclub. In particular, there was an alarming uh, statistic I saw. The GAO reported that between February 2004 and December 2015, known or suspected terrorists initiated uh, background checks to purchase a weapon, I think it was about 2,500 times, and 91% of the transactions were allowed to proceed. Uh, does this concern you? I'm not familiar with the specific report the, that you mentioned. Uh, I will say that much as Secretary Duke has said, we're, we're really focused on the terrorists themselves, whether they be domestic or international, uh, and they seem in many ways uh, hell-bent on committing attacks to kill as many people as possible by whatever means they can get their hands on. Uh, I guess uh, my, so d without looking at the report, would it be concerning to you that um, people who are on the known or suspected terrorist list are are purchasing guns, and 91% of those people are allowed to purchase guns. Is that concerning at all to you? Certainly, the way you describe it is very concerning to me. Right. Yes. Thank you. I yield back. General Lay yields. Uh, Mr. Garrett from Virginia is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would commend the general lady on pointing out these deported veterans issues. I was reading about that, and I saw that um, one. Um, was deported after he was convicted of shooting into an occupied vehicle in 2010. I'm not sure who the president was then, but uh, it's nice to see the attention getting brought on this subject matter now. Um, so I would commend her for pointing that out and cite a Los Angeles Times story that points out that each of the individuals in question deported between 2008 and 2016 had committed a crime, and there might be up to 350 of such individuals. But back to the testimony at hand, um, I'm curious, um, I saw in uh, Ms. Duke's testimony that the federal um, agencies had coordinated prior to the events in Charlottesville. I think that's a good thing, certainly more is needed. But when you have large gatherings of people, say for example, uh, Saturday at 2 p.m. at my high school, which is in Congressman Bratt's district and not my own, um, a state semi-championship football game will be held, probably about 8,000 people will be in attendance. Is there any federal coordination for security for that sort of event? Um, unless it's a national declared national security event, our coordination is with the responsible of local officials. Um, we call that a soft target, and we do quite a bit of training, coordination, and assistance in advance to right. help them secure. And so, and, and, I, and I apologize for the way, the way this is going because it's not intended to be a gotcha, and I'm going that way almost reflexively too much time as, as a courtroom lawyer. Um, but obviously, an event like that presents a soft target, as you indicated, and, and a collaboration or a, a, a gathering of people in close proximity to one another. And yet technology recently has demonstrated via numerous videos on the internet of the ability to use drones as weapons, et cetera. There are numerous unclassified videos on sites ranging from the New York Times to the Washington Post of um, 40 millimeter hand grenades being dropped through the cupolas of M1 tanks, et cetera. We've all seen them. Uh, and yet the anti-drone gun technology that currently exists is limited in its capacity to be sold specifically and exclusively to federal law enforcement entities. I would submit for any of you to comment on that the first line of defense at that football game on Saturday will be local law enforcement with probably some augmentation by state law enforcement, but that we do a historically wonderful job of preparing for the last conflict or the last attack, and we generally do a relatively poor job, which has been brought to the forefront post 9-11, of contemplating what that next attack might be. For example, the weaponization of vehicles that members of the panel have made reference to that we've now seen all too many times, not only in Europe, but most recently in the United States. Can somebody tell me why uh, the Virginia State Police or the Henrico County uh, Police Department or the Albemarle County Police Department can't purchase anti-drone technology when things like UVA football games or the NASCAR race at Richmond Motor Speedway occur under the protection of these entities. Can somebody give me a good reason why local and state law enforcement can't avail themselves of anti-drone technology? 
I want you to say no, but if there's a good reason, I want to hear it too. Uh, no, there is no good reason. I think it's go, as the chairman said, to the legacy of authorities and not having the authorities because of the, um, the it's kind of inflated with the signal waves of cell phones um, and how they're tracked. So it, it needs to be addressed. But it, and thank you very much. And again, I'm on the same team as all of you guys here, and I apologize again for my tone. It's, I'm going to try to snap out of it. Um, would it, in your estimation, be a good policy um, um, area to consider uh, to power down um, the ability to purchase anti-drone anti technology to state and local authorities, given that they are the first line of defense on, on, on so many soft target events that occur every single day in this country. Not to the civilian on the street, perhaps, but to law enforcement entities at the state and local level. I think um, also their ability to use them in anti-terrorism um, use, and the federal government as well. We are limited just as state and local governments are. Oh, absolutely, and, and so what you're suggesting then is that we should review and mass the the employment doctrine as it relates to these particular uh, these particular technological advances. Yes, I'd yield back early, Mr. Chairman, just because I want to set a precedent today. Well, we we certainly appreciate that, as do the witnesses. Uh, Thank chair you. recognizes Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'd ask unanimous consent to submit a statement from the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, without objection, so ordered. Thank you, sir. And um, uh, I'd just like to thank um, all the witnesses for their service uh, to this nation uh, to this point. And uh, I'm, I'm going to be very brief, because I, I, in the interest of time, um, you know we have another panel, but um, I just and excuse me if this has already been answered, but I came in late. Um, this uh, what is it? The black what's this new term? Black extremist radical? What is it? I, I believe the the term you're. Uh, uh, reaching for there is, uh, there's a term black identity extremist, which yeah, is in an intelligence product uh, that was, that I uh, spent, um, you know, about two hours, I guess, discussing yesterday with uh, some of your colleagues. Right, yeah, I, sorry I missed that. Uh, but it, could you give me a brief definition of, or, or an example of who would fall in that category? So the, the intelligence product in question um, refers to individuals who are uh, committing violent criminal acts where the motivation is uh, retaliation or retribution for injustices committed uh, by law enforcement. So the focus is on law enforcement as victims in those situations. Okay. And um, you see a, a growing incidence in this? In this situation, the uh, the piece in question, which was issued uh, right before I joined the FBI, um, was based on uh, a snapshot in time over the course primarily of 2016, and that was what the FBI was seeing during that period. Okay. Uh, yeah. It, thank you for that, and and just like to ask the, the three, I am um, the ranking member on emergency preparedness response communications, and I'd like to um, just ask, I've done a lot of work around interoperability, and I know you're each a different um, entity, but uh, how, how well, um, and your communication is probably pretty good on your level, but uh, through your different departments, uh, how is the, the communication between your different agencies? I think, um our communication is much better than it was when I was uh, here before, and I think that's a lot to the centers of bringing these centers together where people are co-located, so it's not just an integration of systems. I think in the public uh, sector, the uh, FirstNet public safety network is going to be huge going yeah. forward. I do think we're working at DHS more on um, declassifying <laughs> products earlier, so through our fusion centers and other tools, we can have better collaboration between federal and state and local law enforcement. That's a major focus for us. I, I would agree that the, the technological part of the interoperability has improved significantly, although it can always get better. 
uh, for us in particular on the FBI side, uh, the classified nature of so much of what we do does complicate our ability to communicate, less so with with either the folks uh, here on the panel, but right. as Elaine says, with the um, state and local law enforcement, that can get complicated. And certainly with the private sector, which, as we discussed um, on the cyber side, that, that presents some significant challenges. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir? The only thing I would add is that that level of integration that, that probably wasn't there among a, the federal agencies 10 or 12 or 15 years ago has in some ways been um, addressed because at this point so many of our senior leaders have served in each other's organizations over the last dozen years. Several of my senior leaders are veterans of the Department of Homeland Security. I have senior FBI personnel inside my organization and have my personnel have served inside their organizations. That counts for a lot because it makes that integration much easier. Okay. Thank you, um, and Mr. Chairman, I'm going to yield back real quick. Gentleman yields, uh, the lady, general lady from Arizona, Ms. McSally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for your patience, and uh, Director Rasmussen, thanks for your service. Uh, I, too, agree that our country is safer because of your service. Um, many vulnerabilities have been talked about today that uh, radical Islamist terrorists uh, can use and have used in order to uh, hurt America, attack us and our citizens in our way of life. And uh, you and all the people on your teams are out there every single day on the front lines keeping us safe. One of those vulnerabilities was just used 30 days ago uh, when Sufulo Saipov killed eight people and injured dozens uh, in New York City on the bike path. And he came from Uzbekistan and came through the visa lottery program. For those who are not familiar, this was created in 1995 specifically to help Irish immigrants. Uh, and since 2007, it's estimated 29,000 people from uh, countries that sponsor terrorism, Syria, Sudan, Iran, uh, have actually used this program uh, to come to America. No other country that admits immigrants, like we do, a million a year, we are an immigrant-friendly country, has their visas handed out by chance, uh, not no other, but many others, like Canada, Australia, Austria, the UK. They don't have a program like this. By chance and lottery, people can gain access to come into our country. So my question, uh, Director Duke, or, sorry, uh, Acting Secretary Duke, is if he had come to the United States today um, versus 10 years ago, uh, what checks would he have encountered? How would it be different from the process he went through 10 years ago? And would the fact that he came from a country that has a history of terrorism impacted that? Uh, yes, it would have. Um, we, we also see that the diversity program is, is ripe for fraud. Today it would be better, but we still uh, agree with your sentiments on it isn't the, most, the best use of our immigration system. What would be different is we have biographics, we have the ability to search social media, and those type of things, but it is still one that would introduce risk. So I recently introduced legislation to eliminate the lottery, uh, convert a portion of them to merit-based, uh, which I believe is the right thing to do. Uh, President Trump has called for the elimination of this program. Uh, Acting Secretary Duke, do you agree with the elimination of this program? Yes, I support that. Great, thank you. Um, I do want to uh, change gears on another topic that is uh, deeply troubling to me, and I know we're in an unclassified setting, uh, but this is the MAVNI program. And uh, this is a program where uh, non-green card holders, which traditionally we allow green card holders to serve in the military, but non-green card holders, uh, starting in 2008, uh, were allowed to start serving. And it was supposed to be in specific critical career fields, like languages and other things, to boost our national security. Unfortunately, I'm on uh, the Armed Services Committee, and so we've gotten multiple classified briefings on this. And I know we can't speak in great detail uh, in this setting. But unfortunately, it looks like the Army basically used this to meet its recruiting goals well beyond the intent. Uh, and many of these individuals were not vetted properly. Uh, and many come from countries that are our adversaries with very sophisticated foreign intelligence operations, getting a fast track to citizenship in basic training before any vetting uh, went on. I am deeply concerned about the impacts. Now, there, I'm sure there's many good people in th that uh, are served our country through this program, but the potential and the vulnerabilities uh, have caused the DOD to halt this program. Uh, and uh, I'm just, I'm so concerned about the implications of those who were already in it and the fact that they were not vetted, and now they're U.S. citizens, so they clearly have constitutional rights. So I just would like to hear all of your thoughts on whether you're aware of this program, and are, what are we doing now to mitigate uh, any of these vulnerabilities and these threats for those that have already been through it because of the buffoonery of what happened that is, is, is potentially impacting our national security. 
Um, I, I am aware of the program and that it is suspended. Um, I, I, DHS and, and I are, believe we have to vet every individual. We believe in a legal immigration system, yeah. but have to balance security and make sure we vet all persons coming into the United States permanently or temporarily. Director Ray, in, in counterintelligence roles, are any uh, uh, part that you're playing right now, even to try and mitigate and address these threats, potential threats? Uh, well, we try to investigate wherever we can and we get intelligence about people of the sort you're describing mm -hmm. and try to pursue those and share that information working with our fellow colleagues in the interagency. So I'd like to maybe follow up in a classified setting with you as to whether there's any open investigation specifically related to um, this issue. And I do want to ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, to insert into the record, we did uh, write a letter together um, to uh, USAIS and we've got the response here. I'd like to uh, put that in the record on this issue. Without objection, so ordered. Director Rasmussen, any comments? The only thing I'd add is I was not aware of this particular vulnerability. Uh, one thing that I think might contribute to um, identifying potential sources of concern about the, in this population is depending on their status, indiv some individuals now are subject to recurrent vetting. That, vetting that goes on long after they have been through the initial admission process. That changes, obviously, when they gain status as, as a citizen for, in the, for the reasons you suggest. But it, it, it could mean that some members of this population are still subject to some vetting process. Thanks. And I'm over my time, but I would like to follow up uh, in a classified setting with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say I, I echo the gentleman from Arizona's concerns. I'm glad to hear this program is suspended. I met with the director of USCIS yesterday and encouraged him uh, to get the classified briefing on this program. And with that, uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. Um, so we've talked a lot about sort of the evolving terrorist threat abroad, and it does seem that ISIS is steadily losing territory in western Iraq and eastern Syria, which opens up an opportunity for us to exploit a lot of valuable intelligence uh, on the battlefield in the form of biometrics, fingerprints, uh, documents, uh, media devices. And this is vital that we collect it and then find a way to get that information to um, those outposts that are vetting people who want to come into this country, and uh, visa applicants, refugees, asylees. Because um, in the past, we have had examples where people have come into this country who are tied to terrorist groups. To what extent, and I guess I would direct this to uh, Acting Secretary Duke, to what extent do you think this battlefield information that's being cop uh, captured by uh, our military operators and other uh, intel folks in the field being incorporated into your respective agencies' operations and investigations? I think this is one of the areas that has improved most, to be honest with you. Um, DHS is now an active member of the National Security Council, as is um, Director Rasmussen, and we get the same intelligence both before and after an incident. And I think that counterterrorism efforts uh, overseas, uh, led by Department of Defense and, and, and CIA, are, are probably the area I've seen the most progress in. Yeah. What I would add to that is that the battlefield intelligence of the sort that you're describing, Mr. Gallagher, is most useful to us when it contains specific identity intelligence, when we can learn names, dates of birth, passport numbers, identity document and information, and so that that can be used to feed our database of, of known and suspected terrorists. That is the intelligence database that all of Acting Secretary Duke's immigration programs is bouncing off of as they are making decisions and, and vetting potential ad, admissions to the country. So the, the better, the richer, the deeper that database, the more likely it is we're, we're going to have the information that will identify sure. a potential bad actor. It still is Imper imperfect in that you can never have the totality of the information that you would want, but there's no question but that what's happened in Iraq over the last several months has given us uh, a wealth of new information that's helpful in this regard. Uh, I would just add that, uh, and I agree with the sentiments that both of my uh, co-panelists have expressed, but I would also add that the FBI has people forward deployed with the military so that we're trying to collect biometric information wherever we can, and that has turned out to be very useful in some cases uh, to identify people who are then returning or going elsewhere who weren't on people's lists, whether in the U.S. or in our foreign partners as well. Uh, and I think going forward, that's going to be another place where we can be more effective. And let me jump in on one other issue that's come up quite a bit in the, in the hearing today. Much of what we've learned about terrorist potential use of 
UAVs or UAS um, devices as an aviation threat has been learned from what we've, what we've seen on the battlefield in Iraq. And rapid exploitation of that material, rapid sharing here in the homeland so that local law enforcement does know that there is a threat to a high school football game of the sort that we were talking about. Sure. A lot of that is derived directly from battlefield intelligence. Well, it's heartening to hear that you all three seem to think is headed in the right direction, though there's room for improvement. And as a veteran of the, uh, the NCTC Ops Center, and many a night shift was spent from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m. pouring over those databases. So I'm glad to hear uh, your sentiments on that. Um, Acting Secretary Duke, I thank you for highlighting in your testimony the important work of the uh, committee's task force on denying terrorist entry in the United States. Uh, as chairman of that task force, I'd also like to thank the department for your cooperation while we've been conducting uh, the review. Uh, we're looking forward to releasing the task force's final report in the near future. I look forward to working with all of you to implement uh, its recommendations or shore up any areas that you don't think we paid enough focus to. Um, and earlier you discussed how our, some of our foreign partners lack the necessary capabilities to close gaps in their security and stop terrorist travel. This actually matches one of the key findings of, in our task force report, and some of the recommendations will focus on DHS's cooperation with our foreign partners. Can you briefly describe some of the work DHS is currently doing with our foreign partners to address any overseas vulnerabilities that pose a threat to our homeland? Well, one of the main areas is using systems that either we have and offer them to use that track people, that track uh, known terrorists. Um, the, what M Director Rasmussen talked about, we have international partners feeding into that same known terrorist database. We think that that info sharing is number one. Addition, documentation, having the right doc documentation with the biometrics. Um, and actually, the other part is not only inputting, but using the databases to make their own determinations with the borders so open, especially in Europe. Those are a few of the areas. Sure. Uh, thank you. I uh, yield the balance of my time. Gentleman yields. Um, and before I close, I also want to um, also um, share the concern, uh, Secretary Duke, that you raised in your prepared testimony about the relationship potentially between transnational criminal organization and a potential terrorist that could bring terrorists into the United States, uh, but also weapons of mass destruction that we saw highlighted in Dubik magazine where they talked about the ease with which uh, that could be accomplished. And I think that uh, certainly raises a, a warning sign and I think demonstrates the need to get the border secure. Um, I also want to thank um, uh, Director Ray. Uh, I also um, share your concern about uh, 702. Uh, as for me, uh, this member, this chairman, I'll be working closely with other like-minded members to make sure that happens. And Director Rasmussen, this will be your last testimony before uh, this committee. Um, I just want to commit this, you. This or any committee. And, and it, or any committee, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and I just want to thank you for your service. Um, you'll be missed, but I know you'll be close, uh, close by. Uh, I want to thank all three of you for your service and most importantly, the men and women who serve uh, uh, in your organizations. Uh, with that, uh, this, um, uh, we're gonna uh, take a brief break and then begin with our second panel.